the issues and concerns in promoting wider public private partnership. These are lofty goals, but what exactly has the forum done to achieve them? CIOF has actively contributed to key national projects, such as the creation of the CIO Council, served in the advisory board for the automated election, and sits in the steering committee for the medium-term information and communications technology harmonization initiative. It also assisted in the development of policy proposals for the e-governor master plan, which is the ICT component of the Philippine Development Plan, and contributed to the development of cloud computing policies for cloud services for the government. The forum also continuously assists the government in developing the standard ICT organization for NGAs, LGUs, and GOCCs, and in formulating guidelines for ICT procurement processes. CIOF will continue to coordinate with stakeholders and initiate discussions and consultations to improve technology-related policies and programs that impact the lives of every Filipino. Be part of CIOF. Let's improve the state of e-governance in the country. Upon leaving government service, CIOF members enjoy career longevity within the ICT industry by becoming a member of CIOF's partner organization, the Chief Information Officers Forum Foundation. The CIOF Foundation is an organization dedicated to the advancement of technology-based knowledge for more efficient and effective governance. As such, the vision of CIOFF, a wider use of e-governance for an empowered citizenry, to promote buy-in by decision makers and to undertake activities to support the implementation of e-governance initiatives. This mission is carried out by the CIOFF Board of Trustees with the support of its members, composed of former and incumbent chief information officers heads of ICT departments, data protection officers, and cybersecurity officers of different government agencies and local government units. Sounds like the CIOF, right? But what makes it different from the forum? Apart from its common advocacy and capacity building programs with CIOF, it extends material and non-material services to members and guides CIOS on project development and management in their office. The Foundation initiates and undertakes projects that increase and sustain funding for CIOF programs and acts as a major resource for all the branches of the government's pool of ICT experts. The CIOF Foundation continues to update and build its capacity, maintain and sustain its knowledge, skills, and expertise in its advocacy for a more efficient and effective delivery of digital public services and continue to partner with technology and development institutions to keep us in sync with global ICT advancements, thus improving the Philippines' global competitiveness. Just imagine how much faster, more economical, and more convenient it will be for all of us to avail of required public services once data linkages and interconnected government are in place. CIO Forum and the Foundation, together, we work towards citizens' digital empowerment and in advocating a transformed and connected government. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm here to talk about Educate. If you don't know what Educate is, well, it's a solution to the current educational problem here in the Philippines. It all started when the world got screwed over by the virus. No one was allowed to meet face to face. That includes classes. So Aldrin, the CEO of Educate, decided to develop a system that would help the Philippines with their educational problems. With his expertise working in Australia, he brought about Educate, a one-stop place for online learning to be a solution to the current problems of learners and educators. This includes a learning management system, hosting, maintenance, training, support, and many more.
to provide the right tools and expertise to make distance learning simple and easy. We believe that no Filipino students should be left behind. So what are you waiting for? We welcome you to the Educate family. To succeed today, organizations need to adapt and evolve with new skills and capabilities from machine learning to design thinking, blockchain to business skills. And the need is massive. 74% of organizations know that reskilling their workforce is important in the next 12 to 18 months, but only 10% feel ready to address this trend. At Skillsoft, our goal is to democratize learning. So we set out to create a new kind of platform based on a fundamental belief that every person has the potential to be amazing. The result, a digital learning platform driven by flexibility and personalization. It's powered by AI, but has people at its heart. Skillsoft Percipio helps learners accomplish goals, celebrate their journey and unleash their edge. How does Percipio do it? It's all about the journey. Aspire journeys are pre-curated, role-based, and skill-based learning paths that help companies prepare employees for the high-demand roles needed today and tomorrow, like agile development, data science, cloud computing, and leadership development. AI makes it easy. Breadth of content is great, but you need curation and customization to make it useful. Our AI-driven homepage keeps things fresh, engaging, and relevant for each and every learner. Search in human speak. Percipio's search functionality uses Google BERT natural language processing AI, which means learners spend more time learning and less time searching. Badger, learners celebrate, record, and socialize their achievements with verifiable digital badges that are theirs to keep. Over 5 million earned and counting. Seamless experience everywhere. Percipio lets users learn in whatever increment they have time for. Bouncing between media formats, devices, and collaboration tools like MS Teams seamlessly, without losing track or progress along the way. They can even learn while in the flow of work with our embedded learning synchronized assistant, ELSA for short. Customization and integration. Administrators can customize learning tracks, host content from other providers, and integrate into any LMS. We make it easy to make it your own. Our users already love the results they're getting from Precipio. And that's just the beginning. As the market evolves, so will Precipio, with more capabilities, more integration, and more ease of use with every iteration. Each step brings us that much closer to our mission, to democratize learning and help organizations, teams, and individuals unleash their edge. How do we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more? It starts with one. One employee. One developer. One organization. From one employee to a team collaborating with another team. From one organization to their customers, to their customers' customers. Helping local communities, creating jobs increasing productivity for the global economy our society our world 
That's the impact. That's the impact. That's the impact each of us can have. That's our opportunity. 100,000 plus employees. 75 million organizations. 7 billion people on the planet. 100 to 75 to 7. To make every small business more productive. To make every large business more competitive. To make nonprofits more effective. To make government institutions more responsive. To expand access to education. To improve healthcare outcomes. And to amplify human ingenuity. When we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, we empower the world.
Upon leaving government service, CIOF members enjoy career longevity within the ICT industry by becoming a member of CIOF's partner organization, the Chief Information Officers Forum Foundation. The CIOF Foundation is an organization dedicated to the advancement of technology-based knowledge for more efficient and effective governance. As such, the vision of CIOFF, a wider use of e-governance for an empowered citizenry, to promote buy-in by decision makers and to undertake activities to support the implementation of e-governance initiatives. This mission is carried out by the CIOFF Board of Trustees with the support of its members, composed of former and incumbent chief information officers heads of ICT departments, data protection officers, and cybersecurity officers of different government agencies and local government units. Sounds like the CIOF, right? But what makes it different from the forum? Apart from its common advocacy and capacity building programs with CIOF, it extends material and non-material services to members and guides CIOS on project development and management in their office. The Foundation initiates and undertakes projects that increase and sustain funding for CIOF programs and acts as a major resource for all the branches of the government's pool of ICT experts. The CIOF Foundation continues to update and build its capacity, maintain and sustain its knowledge, skills, and expertise in its advocacy for a more efficient and effective delivery of digital public services and continue to partner with technology and development institutions to keep us in sync with global ICT advancements, thus improving the Philippines' global competitiveness. Just imagine how much faster, more economical, and more convenient it will be for all of us to avail of required public services once data linkages and interconnected government are in place. CIO Forum and the Foundation, together, we work towards citizens' digital empowerment and in advocating a transformed and connected government. Within an organization, CIOs are vital in the development of policies and in the management of all resources relevant to information and digital technology. CIOF stands for Chief Information Officers Forum. CIO Forum or CIOF is a duly registered professional association of government information and communications technology executives and managers or CIOs development plan and contributed to the development of cloud computing policies for cloud services for the government. The forum also continuously assists the government in developing the standard ICT organization for NGAs, LGUs, and GOCCs, and in formulating guidelines for ICT procurement processes. CIOF will continue to coordinate with stakeholders and initiate discussions and consultations to improve technology-related policies and programs that impact the lives of every Filipino. Be part of CIOF. Let's improve the state of e-governance in the country. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm here to talk about Educate. If you don't know what Educate is, well, it's a solution to the current educational problem here in the Philippines. It all started when the world got screwed over by the virus. No one was allowed to meet face to face, 
That includes classes. So Aldrin, the CEO of Educate, decided to develop a system that would help the Philippines with their educational problems. With his expertise, working in Australia, he brought about Educate, a one-stop place for online learning to be a solution to the current problems of learners and educators. This includes a learning management system, hosting, maintenance, training, support, and many more to provide the right tools and expertise to make distance learning simple and easy. We believe that no Filipino students should be left behind. So what are you waiting for? We welcome you to the Educate family. To succeed today, organizations need to adapt and evolve with new skills and capabilities from machine learning to design thinking, blockchain to business skills. And the need is massive. 74% of organizations know that reskilling their workforce is important in the next 12 to 18 months, but only 10% feel ready to address this trend. At Skillsoft, our goal is to democratize learning. So we set out to create a new kind of platform based on a fundamental belief that every person has the potential to be amazing. The result, a digital learning platform driven by flexibility and personalization. It's powered by AI, but has people at its heart. Skillsoft Percipio helps learners accomplish goals, celebrate their journey and unleash their edge. How does Percipio do it? It's all about the journey. Aspire journeys are pre-curated, role-based, and skill-based learning paths that help companies prepare employees for the high-demand roles needed today and tomorrow, like agile development, data science, cloud computing, and leadership development. AI makes it easy. Breadth of content is great, but you need curation and customization to make it useful. Our AI-driven homepage keeps things fresh, engaging, and relevant for each and every learner. Search in human speak. Percipio's search functionality uses Google BERT natural language processing AI, which means learners spend more time learning and less time searching. Badge up. Learners celebrate, record, and socialize their achievements with verifiable digital badges that are theirs to keep. Over 5 million earned and counting. Seamless experience everywhere. Percipio lets users learn in whatever increment they have time for. Bouncing between media formats, devices, and collaboration tools like MS Teams seamlessly, without losing track or progress along the way. They can even learn while in the flow of work with our embedded learning synchronized assistant, ELSA for short. Customization and integration. Administrators can customize learning tracks, post content from other providers, and integrate into any LMS. We make it easy to make it your own. Our users already love the results they're getting from Precipio. And that's just the beginning. As the market evolves, so will Precipio, with more capabilities, more integration, and more ease of use with every iteration. Each step brings us that much closer to our mission, to democratize learning, and help organizations, teams, and individuals unleash their edge.
How do we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more? It starts with one. One employee. One developer. One organization. From one employee to a team collaborating with another team. From one organization to their customers, to their customers' customers. Helping local communities, creating jobs, increasing productivity for the global economy. Our society. Our world. That's the impact. That's the impact. That's the impact each of us can have. That's our opportunity. 100,000 plus employees. 75 million organizations. 7 billion people on the planet. 100 to 75 to 7. To make every small business more productive. To make every large business more competitive. To make nonprofits more effective. To make government institutions more responsive. To expand access to education. To improve healthcare outcomes. And to amplify human ingenuity. When we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, we empower the world.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good Thursday morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, fellow CIOF members and workers in government, partners from the industry. It gives me pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 CIOF first online general membership meeting and conference with the theme, Securing an Inclusive and Reliable Connectivity hashtag ICT for vaccination program. We are begin. We are about to begin our program. I am your MC this morning. My name is Patricia May M. Abejo, your fellow CIOF member and currently the director of the Knowledge Management and Information Service of the Department of Trade and Industry. I will be accompanying you today as your MC. Before I uh, begin the program, allow me to quickly share some reminders. Uh, first, I hope you're able to uh, visit our open forum page, please do register with your questions to any of our honorable speakers. Uh, please post them in our Q&A um, uh, uh, forum. Um, and um, uh, for our speakers, uh, they have already agreed to share their presentations. Um, so we will um, uh, share them with you uh, as part of our uh, commitment to share information okay and then um i would like to invite you also to please accomplish the feedback forms that will be sent to your email this is very important for us to get your thoughts insights from the program this morning and we request everyone to please mute your microphone uh, so open your camera only when you're about when you're invited to speak all right um thank you for that um okay we will now um proceed but before i do that i'd like to um uh acknowledge our uh, partners for our meeting um uh, this morning, I uh, would like to thank our conference partners, Educate this is our virtual event management system and conference platform, uh, Microsoft Philippines and Converge ICT. From uh, just to proceed, just wanted to uh, also acknowledge our partners from the government, the Department of Information and Communications Technology, and the Department of Health. All right, let's proceed with our program. I hope I'm sure you're very excited, uh, but before we uh, really kick off the program. We have to start with a prayer. So now let me call on Ms. Maria Rose Teresa Morales. She is our secretary from the CIO Forum, and she also is from the Department of Finance to give us the opening prayer. And afterwards, please do stand by for the Philippine National Anthem. ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Dear God, we offer everything 
coming to you during this challenging time. May we ask for your blessing and divine providence that the learnings set for this undertaking be successful and effective in each of the agencies that the CIUF members represent, and most importantly, to the Filipino people which we serve. May we also retain the invaluable knowledge and learning experiences that we derive from this activity for actual application and implementation. We pray that you bless all the CNOF members, that they fulfill their tasks responsibly, that the objectives they have set may all be achieved. Your generous blessing would mean the success, not only of the DIY cost, but also of the IT cost of the entire bureaucracy. We know that without you, we do nothing. May we believe in the pieces of your genuine love through the implementation of the knowledge acquired through this activity. Grant us your divine wisdom as we go about our daily tasks. This we ask in Jesus' name. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang maghiliw, kaya sa sikahanan, alam ng puso sa nitipoy buhay. Lupang pinitang, kaya ka ng mag-ibig, sa manlutupin. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, this is again the 2021 CIO Forum first online general membership meeting. And before we proceed, I wish to acknowledge again our sponsors, um, Technology Platform Educate as our virtual event uh, management system and conferencing platform. We'd also wish to thank Microsoft Philippines, and Converge ICT. All right. We also have our partners from the government sector. So we'd like to thank, again, the Department of Information and Communications Technology and the Department of Health. All right. OK. Um, I know you're very excited with our program this morning. Uh, it's good to have you on a sunny Thursday morning here um, to kick off our meeting this quarter. I'd like to call on um, our first speaker um, for this morning. So uh, allow me now to um, welcome our president, <laughs> um, the uh, president, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Fiap, um, to give her welcome remarks and to officially start our program. Uh, she will also, uh, following her welcome remarks, she will be inducting a new members for the CIO forum and she will also proceed in introducing our keynote speaker. So without further ado, we'd like to uh, welcome former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Public Works and Highways, our President for the CIO forum, Ms. Dr. B. Elizabeth Yap. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2021 CIOF first online general membership meeting and conference. For the year 2021, we have enabling one digital Philippines as our overriding theme. We have also identified quarterly themes to address challenges and key issues and to accelerate digital transformation in government. Thus, for the first quarter webinar, we have for our team, securing an inclusive and reliable connectivity, hashtag ICT for vaccination program. And we are privileged to have with us distinguished guests and speakers to help us understand exciting topics for discussions today. Top of the list is the concern for the nation's urgent recovery from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we feel relies largely on the effective and coordinated implementation of a nationwide vaccination program. But people's apprehensions, ex expectations, demands, state of our connectivity, reliability of our systems and databases, and the implementation of a unified PILSIS database will most likely complicate the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination program. One of the tasks given to the Chief Implementer National Task Force Against COVID-19 is to establish the information and technology infrastructure to capture supply chain information system for the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. This clearly recognizes the role of ICT in enhancing the collaborative responsibilities of concerned government agencies and local government units. We also recognize that the rush for COVID-19 vaccine supplies has placed the Philippines as well as poor and developing countries at the disadvantage and able to compete with rich nations for early deliveries. So our most heartfelt welcome and gratitude to our honored speakers, guests, and delegates. We would like to thank Secretary Gregorio Bihonasan II, who has graciously accepted our invitation to be our keynote speaker and present DICT's role, the steps the department is doing to significantly improve security and provision of connectivity even to unserved areas of the country in light of the COVID-19 vaccination program. Digital learning, digital workers, digital society, digital citizens, and other key programs for e-governance. Under Secretary Dr. Maria Rosario Esbergere to present the role and the challenges of the Department of Health in working with all concerned organizations in identifying recipients for vaccines and other concerns. Another interesting segment of our conference, speaking all the way from Rhode Island, is Reverend Father Nekanor Astriaco, Order of Preachers, to allay our fears and doubts on the COVID-19 vaccination program. We are also excited to learn more about the development of his oral vaccine. Again, another interesting segment of this conference is the panel discussion on ensuring collaboration and teamwork and the COVID-19 vaccination program. We invited resource speakers and experts from the government and industry sectors. We would like to thank and to welcome our panelists from the local government, Mayor Maria Josefina Joy G. Belmonte of Quezon City to present the initiatives of LGUs with respect to the vaccination program. Our panelists from the government sector, Director Jose Carlos P. Reyes of the Cybersecurity Bureau, Department of Information and Communications Technology, to present the role of ICT infrastructure in the national vaccination program, its challenges and gaps in terms of security, reliability, and adequacy. Our panelists from the industry sector to present their initiatives to help the vaccination program in the Philippines Mr. Richard Bon Moya, the National Technology Officer of Microsoft Philippines, Dr. Hernando Bidiliso, Deliso, Chair and Chief Executive Officer, 
Healthcare Business Development Partners Holdings Incorporated and Engineer Ulysses Nagit, the Chief Information Officer of Converge IT, ICT Solutions Incorporated. We would also like to thank our very own Assistant Director Agnes Perpetua Arligaspi of the Department of Trade and Industry for accepting the task to be the moderator of our panel discussions and Director Patricia May M. Abeo, also of the Department of Trade and Industry for graciously accepting the task of being our MC for this conference. To Dr. Jose Rene de Grano, President, Private Hospitals Association of the Philippines Incorporated, and Mr. Ronald De Los Santos, President, Mount Luis Hospitals Incorporated, South Luzon Sector. Thank you other government officials for joining our event and to all participating CIOs and their guests. Our heartfelt appreciation also goes to our industry partners on Converge ICT Solutions Incorporated, Microsoft Philippines, and Intel Solution Philippines Incorporated. So we implore heaven for good Wi-Fi connections and the successful first CIOF general membership meeting and conference in 2021 via Educate, the virtual event management system and conferencing platform of Intel Solution Philippines Incorporated. Thank you at mabuhay tayong lahat. Please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary. Uh, good to have you uh, run through our program this morning and we'll ask her now to proceed with the induction of our new CIOF members. President, yeah, please. Please, uh, uh, please raise your right hand and follow after me. I, please state your name, do a solemnly swear to discharge faithfully and conscientiously my duties and responsibilities as regular member of the Chief Information Officers Forum Incorporated to uphold its bylaws, to adhere to the code of ethics for IT professionals, and to serve the organization my profession and my country with honor and to the best of my ability. I take this oath that I may endeavor to promote and preserve the prestige and honor of the CIO Forum Incorporated. So help me guide. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, President Benz. I just want to acknowledge, welcome our new CIOF members, ma'am. No? Si Mr. Jose Maria Bonto. He's the Vice President, Head of the Data Center of the Development Bank of the Philippines. And Mr. Jerry Jabelia. I think, I hope I uh, pronounce his last name correctly. He is the Director of Administrative Finance and IT of the Tariff Commission. Thank you very much again, President Yap, for inducting our new members. And welcome to the CIOF. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker for today was first elected to the Senate in 1995, the first truly independent candidate in the Philippine political history to win in national elections. He has been elected senator four times as an independent candidate. A progressive but low-key political career our keynote speaker remains a soldier at heart. He has been called a reformist, a rebel, a revolutionary, a destabilizer, among other less flattering labels. But he is, in his own words, just an ordinary professional soldier thrust into extraordinary circumstances. And we are truly fortunate to have DICT Secretary Gregorio B. Bonasan II as our keynote speaker. We extend our profoundest gratitude to the Secretary for gracing our first event for 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Please join me in welcoming the Secretary of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, Secretary Gregorio Vijonasan II. Secretary Carlito G. Galvez Jr., Chief Implementer, National Task Force Against COVID-19, Department of Health Under Secretary Maria Rosario S. Ferreira, Dr. B. Elizabeth E. Yap, President of the Chief Information Officers or CIO Forum, Assistant Secretary Clarito D. L. Magsino of the Department of Budget and Management, and Vice President of the CIO Forum, Ms. Maria Rose Teresa B. Morales of the Department of Finance, and Secretary of the CIO Forum, Assistant Director Agnes Perpetua R. Legaspi of the Department of Trade and Industry, Export Marketing Bureau, Reverend Nicanor Pierre, Giorgio R. Austriaco, Jr., Professor of Biology at Providence College in Rhode Island, USA, partners from the public and private sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It has been a year since the onset of the COVID-19 health crisis in the Philippines, which resulted in a nationwide community quarantine to prevent further virus transmission. During those months of strict enforcement of health protocols and physical restrictions, the need for information and communications technology, or ICT, inevitably increased with the digital world providing a platform where people could carry on with their lives and where society continued to function. Most, if not everything in society, suddenly migrated online from government and business operations and transactions to education and retail. Even our personal lives have been greatly dominated by the use of ICT for information, entertainment, learning, and communication. Recognizing this, the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or the ICT, has doubled its efforts to fast track the country's digital transformation to help our country adapt and transition to the so-called new normal. Focusing on connectivity, e-governance, digital education, skills and jobs, and cybersecurity, our vision is to establish a sustainable and inclusive digital future during and beyond this pandemic. Crucial to our digital transformation efforts is the improvement of internet connectivity in the country. For this, we have strengthened our three major connectivity programs. The National Broadband Program, the free Wi-Fi for all program, and the Common Tower Initiative. Through the National Broadband Program, or NBP, our goal is to establish a government-owned broadband network for better internet quality and wider internet coverage at a more affordable price. Complementing the NBP is the establishment of provincial broadband networks that will be linked to the national backbone. We have already secured partnerships with various local government units as the DICT continues the implementation of the NBP. For last mile connectivity, we have the free Wi-Fi for all program. Through this, we are able to provide free internet access to geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas and to public places across the country, such as government offices, hospitals, public elementary and high schools, and state universities and colleges, among others. The ICT has also deployed free Wi-Fi in quarantine facilities and command centers during the community quarantine to provide assistance to the interagency task force for the management of emerging infectious diseases or IATF MEID. Furthermore, the ICT has issued a common tower policy to help the private sector in their infrastructure rollout. 
The policy is expected to widen the base of common towers and speed up the deployment of internet across the country as it allows and encourages private telcos and internet service providers to share cell towers. With faster rollout of infrastructure by the private sector supplementing our own build-up in government, we can soon experience improvements in internet quality and coverage across the archipelago. In fact, the Philippines climbed to 83rd spot for mobile and 92nd spot for fixed broadband in the global internet rankings this February. The country moved up three slots from 86th ranking for mobile and eight notches from its 100th ranking for fixed broadband last January 2021. We aim to further improve these figures in the coming months. Management systems, VIMS. During the health crisis, we have witnessed how internet, the ICT in general, has been a powerful tool, not just for providing opportunities and better services to Filipinos, but also in combating and mitigating the effects of the pandemic in our country. For the past year, the ICT has been involved in the development of ICT systems for contact tracing, generation of checkpoint passes, distribution of social amelioration, and many more. Now the DICT has once again been given an important task in ending the health crisis in the country with the rollout of the government's vaccination program. The department is set to oversee the Vaccine Information Management System, or VIMS, that shall serve as the key processing and analytic system for COVID-19 immunization administration in the country. The VIMS shall involve process automation, data capture, storage, processing and supply chain management of the COVID-19 vaccines in preparation for its administration to identified stakeholders. At present, the IATF Data Resiliency for Ease of Access and Management, or DREAM, team, which includes the DICT is conducting coordination meetings in different regions in preparation for the rollout of vaccines nationwide in the coming months. The success of the government's COVID-19 immunization program is crucial to ending the health crisis in the country. Thus, DICT commits to doubling its efforts in this endeavor. Likewise, even beyond this pandemic, we commit to further strengthening our ICT programs and initiatives to fulfill our envisioned digital future for all Filipinos, especially our most precious strategic and renewable resource, our next generation of citizens and leaders, our children. Maraming salamat po, mabuhay. Thank you very much, Secretary Nathan, for that um, presentation. Okay, I hope you're all doing well. We have uh, had two speakers already in our uh, conference this morning and we'd like to proceed um, with our third speaker from the Department of Health. Uh, may we request those um, participating in the forum to please mute your mic um, and if you have questions for our speakers, particularly for Secretary Hanasan, we request that you put them in the chat box um, so that we can refer these questions to him. And you heard from his uh, speech, the initiatives that the department is undertaking uh, in the rollout of the national vaccination program of the government. Um, so we're very excited about that. And that also ties up to our next speaker. Um, she is currently the Undersecretary of the Department of Health, so allow me to introduce her. Undersecretary Maria Rosario Verhere 
MDMPH is a familiar sight and voice in the country's response to COVID-19. You see her almost every day speaking about uh, DOH initiatives, advocacies, and what the rest of the government is doing in response to COVID-19. Um, Dr. Verheri also um, serves as the spokesperson of the DOH, and that's why you see her um, quite often responding to uh, uh, concerns and issues that the, the country is facing as far as COVID is concerned. Um, she also served as the chief of the Health Research Division, Health Policy Development and Planning Bureau of the Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Verheri is a doctor of medicine with a master's degree in public health. As one of her roles is uh, overseeing data being managed by DOH. Um, it's good now to have Undersecretary Verhere discuss the national COVID-19 vaccination program and how IT plays a role in rolling out this very important nationwide program. So let's hear it from Undersecretary Verhere. Good morning to all esteemed guests and attendees of the CIOF 2021 First General Assembly. First, let me thank the organizers for inviting me as a guest speaker in this event. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of President Elizabeth Yap and Chairman George Quintanar. Today, I will be discussing the National COVID-19 Vaccination Program and how information and technology plays a critical role in this nationwide project. The National COVID-19 Vaccine Deployment Program aims to have a safe, equitable, and cost-effective immunization for all Filipinos by 2023. To achieve this, it is our mission to institutionalize an end-to-end -end immunization program for COVID-19, which will protect the public and reduce COVID-19 cases and deaths, effectively reducing the strain in our healthcare system. In order to facilitate the National COVID-19 Vaccine Deployment Program, the COVID-19 Vaccine Cluster uses a whole-of-government approach to ensure collaboration among the different government agencies. Our National Vaccine Deployment Plan for COVID-19 consists of seven primary chapters led by different task groups from DOH, DOST, DFA, Department of Finance, and PCOO. The Department of Health continues to work with these agencies for the seamless integration of the National COVID-19 Vaccine Deployment Program from scientific evaluation up until assessment, evaluation, and monitoring. Part of the collaborative approach is the involvement of various experts in the scientific evaluation and selection process of COVID-19 vaccines to ensure that all vaccines that will be procuring and be deploying in the National Immunization Program are safe and effective. Health experts from the Vaccine Experts Panel, the Health Technology Assessment Council, and the Philippine Food and Drug Administration evaluates all COVID-19 vaccine candidates to provide recommendations. The Philippine Food and Drug Administration has already issued emergency use authority for Pfizer-BioNTech, AstraZeneca, Sinovac, and Gamaleya Sputnik. On the other hand, the FDA has already approved the conduct of clinical trials in the country by Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, Clover Biopharmaceuticals, and for Sinovac. Our experts are continuously assessing the submission of other vaccine candidates for EUA or trial approval. Aside from the scientific assessment, our vaccine candidates undergo a formal administrative process led by the vaccine cluster headed by Secretary Carlito Galvez Jr. This includes signing of non-disclosure agreements, which gives protection to both the vaccine manufacturer and the procuring country. The term sheets, which is a document that expresses our interest to procure vaccines, and the supply agreement which initiates how many doses we will be procuring and the specific roles and responsibilities of the manufacturers and the procuring country. In terms of financing, the vaccine cluster, the Department of Finance, and the Procurement Service of the Department of Budget and Management 
are currently coordinating to make various financing options available for our vaccine procurement. Aside from the funds from our 2021 General Appropriations Act, we have secured multilateral and bilateral financing, government-to-government -government agreements and tripartite agreements with our local governments and the private sector. We are also participants of the Gavi COVAX facility through which the Philippines will receive fully subsidized COVID-19 vaccines. For shipment and storage, we inspected various cold storage facilities that were used to accommodate our vaccines, including Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, Unilab, Zwilig Pharma, and Royal Cargo Incorporated. We also have ongoing efforts to inspect facilities in our local governments to ensure the integrity and readiness of our end-to-end -end supply chain and cold chain solutions management. We are also aligned uh, our transportation plan with the requirements of the various incoming vaccines to ensure that we maintain high quality, safe and efficacious vaccines from the moment it arrives in our country until the moment it is administered to our Kababayans. To guide the implementation of our nationwide vaccination, we had been utilizing the three M's, namely master listing, micro planning and mapping. Master listing involves listing the recipients of the COVID-19 vaccine. Microplanning, on the other hand, covers processes such as the procurement and allocation of resources up until the training and simulation of the vaccinators. Finally, mapping scopes out all the vaccine recipients for every vaccination site in order to set a clear system of our activities. To further strengthen and improve the processes involved in the COVID-19 vaccination program, the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group, or NITAG, was created to provide independent, evidence-based technical assessment and guidance to the DOH and to the vaccine cluster regarding COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination protocols. Due to the limited supply of COVID-19 vaccines globally, we have utilized a prioritization framework with guidance from the WHO and advice from our technical working groups. The primary goal of COVID-19 vaccination program here in the country is to reduce morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 while maintaining the most critical essential services. In the context of scarcity, vaccines must be given to those of higher risk of exposure and death. And this includes our frontline healthcare workers, our senior citizens, and persons with comorbidities. For criterion one, the identified priority group, group shall be given access nationwide before we go on to the next priority group. If the incoming vaccine supply is less than the number of people in the population group selected for vaccination, we will go to further prioritization based on criterion two where we consider the geographic location based on COVID-19 burden of disease and LGU readiness to effectively and efficiently deploy the vaccines. But if the incoming supply is still less than the number of people in the population group selected for vaccination in that region, then sub-prioritization may be employed based on criterion three. Criterion three is the sub-prioritization based on exposure and mortality risk. The national government also can adopt similar sub-prioritization by other countries or reputable health institutions like the Centers for Disease Control. Master listing involves a lot of data collection and management. It is a crucial aspect in ensuring that the national immunization program is deployed first to the intended priority groups. As key players in the implementation of the national COVID-19 immunization program, local governments are required to facilitate the master listing of their eligible population. After verification and uploading by the local governments, a unique identifier is indicated in the master list to ensure that vaccines are allocated to properly identified individuals. The COVID-19 Vaccine Information Management System Immunization Registry, which was developed and maintained by the Department of Information and Communications Technology, 
shall be the official platform for master listing and pre-registration of individuals for COVID-19 vaccination. Similar to the deployment of vaccines, master listing involves a phased approach following the discussed prioritization. While our healthcare workers in bigger hospitals and healthcare institutions are being vaccinated now, we already have instructed the local governments to begin master listing healthcare workers in standalone facilities and those who are working in the communities to ensure readiness once more vaccine doses arrive. Local government units should also begin profiling the health status of their population through electronic medical records in preparation to vaccinating the next priority groups until we reach the general population. After profiling, all health facilities and local governments shall submit the required data for master listing to the province or to highly urbanized cities or independent component cities through any of the following methods. Vaccine Information Management System Immunization Registry, Information System of the Local Government linked to the Vaccine Information Management System through an application program interface or through the secured file transfer protocol of VIMS-IR. Dataset consistent with prescribed formats for bulk uploading through the information system or through the assistance of our DOH regional offices. This information will then be used to generate a unique identifier for the eligible population and in the overall vaccination program planning and admi administration. In an order to ensure that we are prepared to manage any adverse events following immunization or adverse events of special interest, we established the National Adverse Events Following Immunization Committee or the NAFIC. And this is supported by our local and regional epidemiology and surveillance units. The DOH will continue to monitor all vaccine recipients for at least one year. Serious AEFI or AESI shall undergo investigation, analysis, and causality assessment to provide the needed knowledge on the incident. Data management does not only involve the vaccine deployment program proper, but the monitoring of adverse events following immunization as well. Data, information generated from the AEFI monitoring system, and recommendations from the National Adverse Events Following Immunization Committee shall be utilized in the continuing quality improvement of the immunization program and upholding of vaccine safety. To enable comprehensive assessment of the COVID-19 epidemic status, vaccine coverage, and vaccine safety that will guide national and local action, all case data will be linked across the COVID-19 information systems. We will be using various platforms for the COVID-19 vaccination registry, specifically covid Gaia, the COVID-19 data repository system, Stay Safe, Contra COVID will be used for case management systems for COVID-19 response. For the COVID-19 vaccine master list registry and administration vaccine information management system will be used. And lastly, VigiFlow will be used as a monitoring system for adverse events following immunization. We will ensure seamless integration of case data between this platform so that appropriate response strategies can be implemented when necessary. To ensure the confidence of the public in receiving our vaccines, the DOH has been conducting demand generation and communication activities. This includes public visits and engagements, orientations with our local chief executives and local health promotion and education officers, media literacy sessions, dissemination of information, education, and communication materials, and the conduct of town hall meetings. We have conducted town hall meetings with different sectors, which includes the medical sectors, faith-based organizations, local chief executives, healthcare workers in our hospital trial sites, and with our city health officers and barangay health workers. The town hall meetings target various sectors and professional groups, 
and provides an avenue for the public to clarify any reservations or hesitations on the COVID-19 vaccination program. We have observed that during our town halls with the different medical societies, vaccine acceptability increased in all sessions by as much as 10 to 20 percent, seen through our pre- and post-meeting surveys. Vaccine confidence among the public is very much anchored on knowing the right information, so I am inviting every one of you to share information from reliable sources. You may always refer to the DOH website, Facebook, and other Viber groups for reliable and validated information. We also encourage you to participate in feedback platforms and report fake news so that this can be debunked for this cause unnecessary confusion and panic, as well as undermine vaccine confidence. Lastly, with the increasing number of COVID-19 cases, as well as the appearance of new variants, we call on everybody to follow the enhanced public health standards. Let me just remind everybody, it is not enough that we wear masks. We must wear it correctly, covering our noses and our chins. We have to complement it by proper wearing of our face shields. It is not enough that we wash our hands with soap and water. We must do this frequently for at least 20 seconds each time. And it is not enough to physically distance ourselves from the people we meet. We must ensure that there is good ventilation and that the time of interaction is kept to the minimum. And it is not enough to know the right thing it is also warranted that we must educate others as well. It is not enough that we are Bida for ourselves. We must be Bida Bastonero for the people we love and for all of our kababayans. With that, I'd like to thank all of you and good day. Okay, thank you very much, Under Secretary, for hearing. What can you say about their presentation? I think she discussed in more detail what the Department of Health is doing as far as the um, national vaccination program is concerned. Um, there are a lot of key takeaways from the presentation of Yusek Verheri. I'm sure you will agree. But as CIOs ourselves, I think we have a role in making sure that we have access to the information um, that is available. No? So I think... Uh, in her presentation, Yusek Verhere did mention that we can always look it up in the DOH website. Um, I think we also have a responsibility to make sure that we disseminate correct information about uh, uh, what the, gov the government is doing uh, in addressing this pandemic. So I think there's been a, a, quite a bit of... Um, information that uh, was shared with us here in the presentation of Yusik Verheri. So we want to thank her once again. Thank you, Department of Health, Under Secretary Verheri, for that very informative presentation. Okay, um, just as a reminder, she did uh, remind us about uh, practicing minimum health standards wherever we go. So, okay, fellow CIO members, let us move on to to our next speaker, I'm sure you're very excited to hear from him. I think he's already in the room. Um, the next uh, presentation will be on inspiring confidence in the vaccination program. It gives me a very distinct privilege to introduce our next distinguished speaker, Reverend Father Nicanor Pierre Giorgio R. Ostriaco, Jr., OP. PhD, STD, who is currently serving as the Professor of Biology and Theology at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island, United States. Um, Father Ostriaco is likewise a research fellow at the Center for Religious Studies and Ethics at the University of Santo Tomas in Manila. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering, summa cum laude, at the University of Pennsylvania, and then earned his PhD in Biology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Ordained a priest in the Order of Preachers in May 2004, Reverend Father Ostriaco also earned his Pontifical License in Sacred Theology, STL, in Moral Theology at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington. 
Washington, D.C. in the U.S. in 2005, and a Pontifical Doctorate in Sacred Theology or STD at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland in 2015. It is indeed my distinct pleasure um, to welcome and to present to you our esteemed speaker. Let us all welcome Reverend Father Nicanor Pierre Giorgio R. Ostriaco, Jr. Good morning, Father, and good evening, by the way, from where you are in the U.S. So, good morning and good evening from the United States, and thank you again for the wonderful invitation to present this morning to the CIO Forum and the CIOF Foundation. Um, what I would like to do over the next 15 minutes is simply to discuss vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence in the Philippines. This is the work that I have been undertaking with a wonderful research team of primarily undergraduate students at the University of Santo Tomas. So the next slide, please. So uh, what, we're, what I'd like to do is to talk about vaccine hesitancy. Uh, next slide, please. And at the end of January, what my students and, di and I did is that we deployed an open access survey into the Philippines using social media. And my students are expert uh, influencers in this regard. And we were able to uh, receive over 15,600 responses from all the regions of the Philippines. And what we wanted to understand in this survey is how Filipinos understood and perceived vaccine hesitancy or vaccine confidence. And what was uh, heartening at this time is that we discovered that based on our respondents, 56% were intending to receive the vaccine. And this is in contrast to several surveys that had been done uh, a month or so earlier, which suggested that vaccine confidence was much lower in the Philippines. Now, let me point out some caveats because this is an open access survey, which basically anyone could fill up as long as they were able to access the link. What you would find is that this survey is going to be skewed towards respondents who have Wi-Fi access around the country. And so we cannot say that this is absolutely representative of Filipinos, but we were able to say that it is a wonderful snapshot, uh, a significant snapshot of Filipinos who are influential on social media. So what I will do is spend a few minutes speaking about our data from this study, which is actually being written up for publication at this time. So next slide, please. What we wanted to do is uh, wanted to understand despite their vaccine hesitancy. So you had 45% or so Filipinos who were um, somewhat wary of getting a vaccine. What you see is that this vaccine hesitancy is not ideological. In contrast, here in the United States, significant numbers of Americans are simply hesitant of vaccines completely. But what you see is that in, based on our survey, significant numbers of our respondents actually believed that vaccination in theory, vaccination in principle, would decrease their chances of getting COVID-19 or decrease their worries about catching COVID-19. So they were, they were hopeful that vaccination was able to do something, but they were still very worried about the concrete realities of this vaccine. Next slide, please. So what were they worried about? What we discovered is they had very concrete concerns about the COVID-19. Uh, most surprisingly, I think, was fake vaccines, though my students pointed out that Filipinos are worried that everything is fake. So they were worried about fake vaccines. They also highlighted side effects, safety, efficacy, and what was perceived to be an accelerated timeline for testing. Next slide, please. Now, what was also striking is we were able to ask our respondents about their preference for vaccine brands. And what we discovered is that half of our respondents, half of the Filipino respondents, had no preference. They were willing to be vaccinated with any vaccine that was safe and efficacious. However, what you can see is there's significant suspicion of vaccines made in China or Russia, this is this is actually very important for us to remember because, uh, in terms of the vaccines that are available in our country at this time, they are primarily Sinovac, which is from China. We receive from what from the news, we received four hundred thousand doses of of Sinovac yesterday, 
And the Gamalaya vaccine from Russia is expected to reach the Philippines in April. And so significant numbers of Filipinos are wary of this, and yet uh, these are what is available. So I, as I will talk about shortly, my students and I have been trying to feed social media with correct data, with scientifically informed data in order to correct this misinformation. Next slide, please. So one of the things we also discovered is that uh, Filipinos are more worried about their families than themselves. So in terms of the data, there were higher numbers for worrying about family members getting COVID-19 or being afraid that someone in the family would get COVID-19. And I think this is important as we move uh, forward in trying to address and to build up vaccine confidence in our country. Next slide, please. And finally, we also uh, wanted to ask questions about the social influences that would impact a Filipino's decision to, in order to be vaccinated. And what we discovered is that uh, many Filipinos, significant number, 77% of the res our respondents are willing to receive the vaccine after many other Filipinos receive the vaccine. And similar numbers are waiting for their politicians to receive the vaccine. And this is one of the reasons why when we first released this data uh, in February, um, we urged the president to be vaccinated in public, precise, especially with a Chinese or Russian vaccine, preferably the Chinese vaccine, actually, because of the large numbers of Chinese vaccines that will be part of our vaccine portfolio in order to reassure the Filipino people that these vaccines are safe and efficacious. Next slide, please. So based on this, this study, we thought that the best way to inspire vaccine confidence in our country was to one, to provide the Filipino people with truthful information. And since you are all involved in information management and information dissemination, uh, the truthful information that will mitigate specific concerns about COVID-19. We also want to emphasize the need to vaccinate to protect not only yourself, but also your families. And we wanted to, and this was something that's deeply Filipino, it's not done here in the United States, for example, is to provide Filipino people with personal testimonies of their Kababayans receiving their vaccine. Because a lot of Filipinos just anecdotally are worried that they will somehow suffer from, or in fact, you know, several people talking to my students online have pointed out that they are worried that um, they will die after being vaccinated or uh, there are certain groups who believe they will be transformed into zombies by the vaccine. So by our hope is that by providing testimonies of people, Filipinos who've already been vaccinated, that this would inspire vaccine confidence. Next slide, please. So what we have done, and this is the my team, is that we have set up a USD COVAX a research team. It's a vaccine awareness team. This is our logo. We have several logos. And our basic message to the public is that vaccination is nothing more than the bite of an ant. And we actually identified a Filipino ant, the Filipino weaver ant, to use as our mascot for the icon for our vaccine campaign. Next slide, please. So this is just an image of some of my research students that we have 30 students from USD who are participating in, in my team. They're primarily from the Department of Biological Sciences. I am a visiting professor of biological sciences at USD this, this year. This is my sabbatical year. Uh, from the industrial biology major, as well as from medical biology, we also have a handful of students from the Department of Advertising Arts from the College of Fine Arts and Design who help us in actually designing and deploying our infographics. Next slide, please. So what we, are, what we do is we create infographics. Uh, this is an infographics of the vaccines that will be used in the Philippines. And we do it both in English and next slide and in Filipino. So uh, if in the next slide, we have a Filipino. Again, we're trying to explain to the Filipino people what it's all about. And then finally, you have here COVAX-19 testimonies that feature vaccinated Filipinos. So we went online and we asked Filipinos from all over the world 
who had been vaccinated. Most of them were healthcare workers in, de in developed countries. So we asked them if they would be willing to send us a selfie along with their testimonies, both in Filipino and in English, or in some cases in Visayan and in their lo local dialect in order to reassure their Kababayans back home that in fact, vaccination is something that we should all do. And you know, I should add that I have been vaccinated. I received the two doses of the Moderna vaccine and I'm now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. So I would like to point out a couple of things from that experience. First of all, um, they talk about the side effects and the side effects are incredibly real, especially the side effects after the second dose. So Moderna, you receive one dose, followed by a second dose 28 days later. So the first dose, um, after receiving the first dose, I had a slight headache. I had chills for about 30 minutes and then it was all over. But for the second dose, wow, the 24 hour, the next day after the second dose, I was very sick. So I had the fever, I had chills for hours, I had a headache, I had incredible body pain, and as well as very exhausted, I was so tired. All of us, and I live in a community of Dominican priests here in the United States, and all of us were vaccinated at the same time because we have elderly Lolo priests who live with us, and to protect them, the state came into our convent and vaccinated all of the priests as well as all of our staff, including our cooks, our janitors, everyone got vaccinated in order to protect the law loss. Now the law loss had no side effects at all, but all of those of us who are younger than 55, and I'm younger than 55, all of us got really sick and some of us got very sick. And I just want to point this out that um, when you will be vaccinated, God willing in the next few months, you should expect that the, the, the side effects will make you very sick for about 24 to 48 hours. So 36 hours after I was vaccinated, after I woke up on the second day, walana, it was completely fine. There were no side effects that lingered. And <clears throat> I remember when I was being injected with my vaccine the second time, the one thing that entered my mind is my mom is now safe. Mama is now safe. Um, my mother is in the Philippines, she's in Las Piñas, and I'm only here in the United States for two months because I returned to the U.S. to work in my laboratory because we are developing an oral vaccine for COVID-19 for the Filipino people. And I, will hope, I had hoped to return to the Philippines this past weekend. However, because of the surge, uh, the explosive surge in the NCR at this time, I've decided to delay my return to the Philippines until we are able to mitigate that surge. But I remember when receiving that second dose, how incredibly liberating it felt. One, to know that my mother is safe, that I did not have to worry about me bringing COVID-19 to her when I visit her in Las Piñas. And two, um, how free it was to be able to leave the, the building, to tr walk around, and to be free. And so it's in, it's really striking. So in my laboratory, I have my I have two research students who have who were um covid who got covid uh, a month ago and then there's me who is doubly vaccinated against covid. So when when we are working together, we can close the door and when we close the door, we remove all our masks. There's no social distancing anymore. And so it is a reminder of normality. It's a reminder that the vaccines will return us to normalcy because, and it's really wonderful to be able to live in my, in my, in my convent here where we have no more masks. We have no, we, we do not have to worry about COVID anymore. Uh, the vaccine has en ended for us in our house. And so one of the reasons why it is so important for all of us to work together to get our entire country vaccinated is because it is incredibly freeing. It is incredibly liberating. You want to sing. Once you remove the mask, you remove the shields because you have been protected with vaccination. And so uh, next slide, please. I'd like to end basically by 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 just pointing two things. So the first thing is that we can use science-based information to build vaccine confidence by appealing to the brain of the Filipino, but it is also important to accompany this, this data-based evidence with the personal stories of our Kababayans to appeal to the heart of the Filipino. And so 
this kind of information for the vaccine um, strategy for the national vaccine campaign is essential, both to the head and to the heart. So thank you again for the kind invitation. Next slide, please. Um, I'm here available, I understand, till 11 o'clock for any questions. Um, I'll be ready to go. And next slide, please. I have one more slide for Mama Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Ostriaco. That was wonderful. Thank you again for the time that you're spending with us this evening there, your time, and this morning here in Manila. Uh, we'd like to meet you um, someday if all of us someday have been Someday without a mask and a shield. Yeah, um, but uh, Father Ostiraco, as you know, we are um, an organization of CIOs. Um, most of us do work in the public sector, um, representing various government agencies. And we also have in the room, by the way, this is being streamed live on YouTube. Um, we also have in the same meeting members uh, or our partners from the private sector. So it's great to have you here with us, sir. But you are among chief information officers is here and I, I i yes we could start with the question and answers and i have some already uh, that were uh shared with me but i'd like to just start off with the discussion sir that um we heard about your appeal in terms of sharing information having access to them and to increase confidence in the vaccine program of the government and we also heard the same thing from our undersecretary from doh i'm sure you know her undersecretary oh, I, we, yes. we, we, yes, we, we, we've worked together yes that's, that's great to know so aside from what you have said and aside from what the undersecretary verheri has said we really wish to be able to support your call to spread the information is there a link sir of a website that you can provide that you can share with us so that we can help pass on this information to our colleagues thank you yes so my students actually set up we are primarily deploying our infographics on social media because that is the a preferred mode of communication, especially amongst millennials and Gen Zers. So my students have set up a Facebook page called uh, USD COVAX Awareness, and we put up all our uh, infographics. They are churning out infographics, about two or three infographics every week, based on the science, based on the stories. Uh, we put up discussion questions. We want to encourage the Filipino people to really intellectually engage in this topic in order to avoid fear. So I can, again, I can probably send it to your con to, to uh, our contacts. Uh, I can send the link for the Facebook page to you and then you can distribute it to the membership. Absolutely, thank you very much, Father Ostriaco. Yes, sir. Um, we've heard some we've gotten a hold of some of the materials about you know that you've even if you've already gotten the vaccine we heard that you could still be in uh you could still contact the virus and that you can still infect others is this correct so uh, let me i'm going to get a little bit biological for a second to give you an explanation there are two kinds of immunity uh one is called effective immunity and this is the immunity that you have when you don't do not get the virus you do not get sick and there's what is called sterilizing immunity where you are not only you do you not get sick but the virus cannot grow in you so you cannot transmit the virus now all the numbers that you've heard about these vaccines are actually effective immunity so we are not sure whether or not these vaccines actually confer sterilizing immunity however there has been incredibly hopeful data out of Israel. You may not, you may or may not know that at the end of this week, Israel will have vaccinated every single person, every single adult in its entire population. So Israel will be the first country to vaccinate the entire country. 50% of their population is already vaccinated with two doses. And by the end of this week or beginning of next week, every single adult will have been vaccinated with at least one dose. So we are getting all this information from the Israeli 
people. And what the Israeli experience has shown is that the vaccine, in this case, it was Pfizer, but we believe that this will be applicable to, to most, if not all, the vaccines, the COVAX vaccines, is that you also decrease the asymptomatic cases, which means that we there is hopeful data, which has to be confirmed, that these vaccines will also prevent transmission, not just illness. Again, this is just data that is coming out uh, recently, so we have to wait until peer review. But the hope, again, is that we will not have to wear masks because once we are vaccinated, not only will we be uh, protected, but we will also not transmit. Wow, amazing experience about Israel, Father Ostriaco. Um, that's that's wonderful for them. Um, for us in the Philippines, the rollout will take some time. But what can you say about herd immunity? We've heard government say that 70% of the population, and then they also say that 100% of the adult population will be vaccinated within this year. So will that help us achieve that herd immunity so that they're talking herd, about? Yeah, so let me, let me explain herd immunity. Um, there's no way I can share as my screen here, can I, on eight educate meat? I was because I have a slide that I could show. But uh, one of the things you have to understand about herd immunity is herd immunity depends upon two numbers. One is what is called the R naught, the reproduction or inherent transmissibility of the of the virus, and the second number is the efficacy of the vaccine. And so when you do those two numbers and you put it into a very simple equation, it comes out to be about 70 to 75 percent of the population must be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity. Now, there are 110 million Filipinos, but 30 million of them are about 16 years or younger, and our vaccines have not yet been approved for them. So in order to achieve herd immunity, we actually have to vaccinate practically every single Filipino adult in order to get the 75% uh, that we need in the population. So there are certain questions. So uh, right now, my research team and I are modeling the vaccination deployment campaign because we want to ask which of the three uh, strategies is the best. One, to vaccinate equally across the 7,000 islands of our beloved country. The second is to focus vaccinations on the three metropolitan areas, Manila, Davao, and Cebu. Or three, to actually focus our vaccination efforts in the NCR. And the reason why I explain this is the NCR is a significant source of COVID-19 in the country. It is like the head of the snake. And so the question we are exploring in our vaccine modeling is can we cut the head of the snake off? So what would happen if we built herd immunity just in the NCR, we cut the head of the snake off, and then we asked the rest of the country in order to kill the, vac the virus in the rest of the country to go into lockdown for two weeks. So two weeks is the period of, of, of incubation, the lifespan of the virus. So if you want to see, so the, the country has 110 million people, we can try to build herd immunity of 75 million people. But the other possibility is you have the 10 to 10 to 12 million Filipinos in the NCR. We build herd immunity in the NCR. So that's like seven or eight million instead of 75 million. We destroy that, we kill the pandemic in the capital. And then there are, are there will be a sources of pandemic elsewhere, but we would ask these smaller communities, these isolated islands in the Philippines, in order to shut down for two weeks. That will starve the virus, and we could slowly eradicate the virus from our country. So there are several ways that you can try to do this. And um, one of the things we're doing is we're developing a computer model to compare these three options. How amazing. Um, in the rollout um, program that uh, Undersecretary Verher represented earlier, um, those three models were not discussed. And I hope that you'll also be able to present that to our 
um, you know, proper authorities here in the Philippines. So those could be explored. I think it makes sense. 70% in NCR versus 70% of the entire population. And we start, we could possibly start with that, Father. Well, see, that's, that's the, but you understand this will cause, it's a politically difficult, right? So I am a scientist, I'm a priest, but I am also aware because I'm a fellow of Okta. So we deal with the politics as well. We're currently trying to manage the, the surge in the NCR and, uh, I do all the hospitalization projections. And so I am deeply concerned that our hospitals in the NCR will reach capacity in about two weeks, where all of a sudden we, we will have no more beds for COVID patients. And people like in California, like in New York, it, like in, in Northern Italy, once this happens, the, it, the healthcare infrastructure begins to fail. And tragically, what you start seeing is people will start dying in, in, the, in the hospital because there are no beds. So we're trying very hard to, to inform using the best science that we have to inform the, our national government and those responsible for the public welfare about the critical need to really contain this pandemic surge in Manila and to do it quickly. I, if, if you remember, I told you that the herd immunity is determined by two numbers, the inherent transmissibility of the virus, and the second one is the efficacy of the vaccine. Well, one of the problems is that we are dealing with the South African variant in Manila, which has now uh, unfortunately, you know, three weeks ago, I was writing and saying, look, we need to stop this variant. It has now spread to all 17 LGUs of Manila. If this, uh, and one of the things people don't realize is this South African variant lowers the efficacy of all the vaccines. And what this means is if it lowers the efficacy of all the vaccines, the number of Filipinos we must vaccinate has to increase to compensate for that. So when you're dealing with 70, 75 percent, now you have to deal with 80, 85 percent. This is millions more of Filipinos that have to be vaccinated because we could not control that variant in the NCR. So there are, there are ramifications of letting the virus run uh, that I think we are not really considering in the long term. We are talking primarily in the short term. You know, I have a deep empathy for the poor and I urge the Filipino government to really provide the necessary ayuda for the poor, especially in these difficult times. But we also have to realize that it's not just the economy in the short term that will suffer. The longer the pandemic runs, the more difficult it is for our country, for our economy, for our people. The best way to help the economy is to shorten the pandemic as fast as possible. And the difficulty is if we let the pandemic run in the national capital region at this time, as we seem to be doing, the number of variants increases, the number of cases increases. This will, and I've argued, this will prolong the pandemic because it will require more numbers of people to be vaccinated and it will require an extra dose in order to deal with the variants. So you can imagine we are already struggling to get two doses of injections into our people. Now we have to get three because we let the variants go crazy. This, this is why you can see there's a deep frustration I, that, I'm pers uh, that I have in looking at the way that the, go the government is now currently managing our surge. Um, Father Ostiaco, you, talk, you talked about the variants, and that's what uh, what we what data has shown us in the Philippines uh, that's responsible for the spike the past uh, few weeks. You know, um, in the briefing with the president last night, I don't know if you heard it. Um, some of our economic managers did present um, their you know their plans, and that you know, of course, the consequences also of shutting down the economy and and pulling back and all of that. So um, they're saying that people will die of poverty if we really expand the you know the, this thing about locking down and shutting down industries and all of that. Um, so we're really worried about. About the, well, this is the economic manager speaking that they're really worried about the poverty incidents that might really spike. And um, I think you're also addressing that with Okta Research and your other uh, members in the team. Um, there are, um, um, Father Ostia, I just want to ask you mentioned that um, if we if the pandemic continues, we will require three variant, uh, three doses. Is that what I'm hearing from you? So and um, then, then what are the vaccines out there for the 
for so, that third so, dose. If, if yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that question. So I, yes, I did view the presentation of our economic managers. And, and like I said, I, I have interacted with the poor as a Catholic priest. I think I, there is this one family outside of UST that are living in their jeepney because they lost their home because of the lockdown. And whenever I think about this pandemic, I think about that poor family with three of their children, they're leaving in their jeep jeepney because they have no more home. And so we would, I would walk around praying my rosary and I would in encounter them. So I'm deeply aware that the poor must be, must, they must be the top concern for our, for our well-being and health. The, the, the challenge I have is that when I was watching the, the slides of our economic managers, they did not take into account the economic cost of the extension of the pandemic. So they're asking this question, if we go into a lockdown for two weeks, this is what the cost will be to our poor. The question I would like to ask our economic managers is, how much more will it cost if the pandemic is extended by two, three, four, five, six months because of two probability, two problems. One is the variants take hold of our country. And when they do this, what will happen is that we will have to increase the number of Filipinos who are vaccinated. And two, in order to respond to the variants, we must get booster shots. So I told you that I have received two shots of Moderna. But Moderna, it turns out, even Moderna is not as effective against the South African variant. So we have been told that Moderna has already making a, a another vaccine against this variant. I'm expected to receive a third dose of Moderna in August or September in order to pr protect me against these variants. So now imagine we are struggling in the Philippines to even deal with the original strain to get to. And now we are going to allow these variants to spread. And what will happen is that this will require that Senate, that Secretary Galvez must not now go back out into the world to get these special doses against the variants. So let me reassure you that these vaccines that you have now, the, the Gamma Laya, the Sinovac, and the AstraZeneca, they will prevent us from getting what is called severe COVID. And this is why when people ask me, what vaccine should you receive? I say the vaccine that is offered to you, that is the vaccine that is there. Go ahead and receive it. You do not know in the long term what variant you're going to come across. And even if you got COVID, hopefully that the, the vaccine you have now will protect you enough that you will not go to the hospital. So it's very important for me to emphasize that, that the vax, we must all be vaccinated as soon as possible with the available vaccines. However, if these variants are allowed to spread and to, to continue to spread in our beloved country, what will happen is that in order to maintain that defenses, in order to maintain the immunity, we will have to purchase another dose. And this is my concern. We are struggling with two, let alone adding a third in you know, in six months, in eight months, because of the fact that the variants are spreading. So uh, I, I, for with terms, so I'm a biologist, so I think long-term, I'm trying to ask how much will it cost our country if the pandemic is extended, if we have to buy extra doses and we have to inoculate more people? What is the economic impact of that compared to a lockdown for two weeks that we would be able, we would be forced to pay off the Ayuda. We must do this. But if we compare the cost, you see the cost is not just no lockdown versus lockdown. It is about how long will the pandemic last and what are the repercussions of an extended pandemic with variants all over the country. I hope that made sense. I hope that you, ha you, are you, you have my perspective of biologists of trying to do the economic risk. It's not just the, the economics of today, it's the economics of tomorrow as well. Yeah, interestingly, uh, Father Ostriaco, I, by the way, work for the Department of Trade and Industry. And one of the speakers last night is my very own secretary, Ramon <laughs> Lopez. <laughs> so um, thank you for your insights about that. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure they did discuss the effect of the pandemic, if it does prolong for another six, seven months. And about that time frame is when they expect that the vaccines will come into the country. But as you said, if the variants do spread, then, you know, what happens to those two doses? You know, we'll have to buy new ones and, you know, go through that same machinery. Again. 
So it's it's really just um, you know we're we're really pleased to have you, and that's an understatement, Father Ostiaco. But I uh, thank you really for your insights and sharing your thoughts. I just have one last question, Father, if you would allow me. And yes. there's a question that was uh, raised to me, and this is about the oral vaccines. What can you mm -hmm. say about these? So um, uh, I am an MIT trained yeast molecular biologist, and so about four months ago, I became incredibly frustrated with the vaccine options for the Philippines because of the need for ultra cold chain or cold chain uh, storage and deployment, as well as the cost. And so one of the things that I am doing here in the United States at this time, working in my laboratory with my students, is we have taken a probiotic yeast. So if you go to Watson's now, if you go to Watts, any of the Watson's in the Philippines, you can buy uh, a for 35 pesos, you can buy a pill of oral probiotic yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii. So what my students and I have done over the last month and a half is we have genetically engineered this yeast so that this yeast will actually produce the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And so what we are, in fact, we are testing that tomorrow to see if it does that. We have some preliminary data that suggests it will do this. The idea is that you would take this yeast uh, in, in a capsule form, you would swallow it, it would go into your stomach. The yeast would protect um, the protein from the acid in your stomach. It would go into your intestine. And we know from years of study that the yeast will actually stay there for a few days. And what it will do is it will produce the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein. And for those of you who are not familiar, the spike protein is the the part of the COVID-19 virus that they inject into you in the vaccine. So this is, instead of injecting it into your body, what we would like to do is we would like to introduce this, this COVID-19 protein instead of in, by injection, but oral delivery, either in a pill or even better, we would have you mix it with milk and then you would drink the glass of milk. Now you notice if this works, and I can bring it home to the Philippines, several things. One is that it's shelf stable. You do not need any refrigerators and it's stable for two years, basically at room temperature. So we can send it to our Kababayans on all the islands of the Philippines. Two, there is no need for a nurse. There's no need for a doctor because all you have to do is you have to take it yourself or put it in your milk. And three, it's incredibly easy and cheap to make. So this is why I'm here. I was in the Philippines for a year and then I came back for two months in order to develop this vaccine. And I'm hoping uh, once the surge is mitigated to return home uh, and we will be testing this in animals in a laboratory at UST. Trish, do you want to ask a question, Trish? Yeah, yes, uh, we'd like to hear from our chairman of the CIO Forum Foundation, Father Ostiaco. Mr. George yes. Kinnar. Yes, yes sir. sir. Father, thank you yes, very, sir. very much for accepting our invitation. We are very, very informed and delighted to hear your very positive information that you gave us all. And we would like to continuously collaborate with you when you come back because we will help you in trying to disseminate this with all our CIOs in government. So I look forward to establishing constant communication with you. Maraming salamat, Father. For thank you, sir. God bless you, and thank you again for inviting me. Salamat po. Thank you. Take care, Father Asiako. Thank you God very much. You. Good night. Nice po. Uh, Father. Amazing. Wow. What can you say yeah. about that? I, I was blown away. You know, I've been watching Father Ostriaco from, uh, someone shared his video with me, so I've been watching him, I've been reading up about him. Um, so it's good to have him in the Okta research team. And um, wow, this really so much information that we learned from him. And that's just 15 minutes of his time, maybe half an hour, no? So kulang na kulang talaga yung oras. But, um, but he did say, um, pamute na lang, sir, anyway. My echo, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Siguro, no, he did say that um, he will share with us the links to his website and some other resources that he can share with us so that we can also pass on his information to our colleagues. Some of the questions that were raised, I hope they were addressed, um, you know, in terms of the types of vaccines available and even the oral one. I'm very excited about that as well. But at any rate, I think... Um, that's quite a bit of information that, uh, to take in, but we're ready now to move into our next panel. Uh, actually, the next part of our program is a panel um, uh, discussion. So um, let's proceed. Um, tuloy -tuloy na natin to, sir, no? um, for our meeting this morning. Allow me now to just uh, introduce to you the the moderator for our panel. She's my colleague in the Department of Trade and Industry. Assistant Director Agnes Perpetua R. Legaspi is the is from the Export Marketing Bureau of DTI and currently supervises the research and knowledge management functions of EMB. Uh, she also oversees programs like the Philippine Export Development Plan and also the Free Trade Agreements. She supervises the halal units of the EMB and also leads it's their in development program. Um, she's the focal point of uh, She Trades Philippines Hub. This is a very, very new program that uh, EMB rolled out. Um, and aside from serving as the assistant director of EMB in DTI, she is also a board of trustee of the CIO Forum um, as its press relations officer. So, a very active co uh, CIOF member and our officer here. Let us all welcome assistant director Agnes Legaspi. Thank you. Away, Agnes. Thank you, Director Trish, and I agree with you. Pulang yung time natin with Father, but hopefully we can get her again. So to proceed with our panel discussion, the COVID-19 vaccination program, ensuring collaboration and teamwork, anchored of course on our 2021 theme, enabling one digital Philippines with our GMMC theme, securing an inclusive and reliable connectivity, hashtag ICT for vaccination program, we have a mixed group of experts coming from different fields. We have, of course, from um, the local government unit, uh, our partner from the national government um, agency, the ICT, from uh, the business and medical field, and uh, from the ICT field. So to start off, uh, first in our lineup, let me just introduce our um, key panelists, uh, the Honorable Mayor of Quezon City holds a social service, social sciences degree from the Ateneo de Manila, a master's degree in philosophy from the Institute of Archaeology, University of College in London, and, an, and another master's degree in museum studies from the Leicester University in the United Kingdom. Um, prior to becoming the city's chief executive, she served as the vice mayor from 2010 to 2019. She presided over a city council, which has been regarded as the most outstanding in the Philippines in accordance with the exemplary standards of the local legislative awards of the Department of Interior and Local Government. Um, she currently serves as the 11th elected mayor of Quezon City, and she believes that the success of the city lies upon having trustworthy leadership, data and information driven decision making and an efficient and well-functioning government system that is worthy of public trust and even during the coronavirus pandemic she proves that through the dedicated service of local government officials and genuine concern for its constituents the city will sur survive all The city will, the city will survive, survive all hurdles of the pandemic. pandemic. So, so let's, let's listen, listen in. in. Uh, we, we can, can attest, attest how hard working our mayor because even late last night she she pre-recorded her message to the to our GMM as well as updates on their vaccination program rollout. So please let's listen in to Mayor Josefina Joy Belmonte. <laughs> My warm greetings to all officers and members of the CIO Forum Foundation. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your general membership meeting and conference. Unfortunately, like most of us, we had to result to these online technologies instead of doing the usual face-to-face -face conference. 
Thank you for following the protocols. And let me remind you that one upside to this setup is that we are keeping ourselves and our families safe by staying in our homes and virtually attending conferences like this. We are one year into this pandemic, and just like any war, we are not sure when or how this will end. But be assured that the city government of Quezon City is doing its best to move forward and away from this deadly COVID-19 virus. Today, I will be sharing with you the vaccination program of our city, which hopefully completes our COVID-19 response. For the past year, we have employed the strategy of test, isolate, and treat. We have established our testing centers, employed additional healthcare workers, and added contact tracers. Several quarantine facilities have been put up to accommodate the growing number of patients. Hospitals were also equipped with the latest machines and facilities, and a molecular laboratory was open to conduct our very own tests. These are just some of our efforts to mitigate the spread of the virus. However, as our economy demands to be opened, people started relaxing their guard against the virus. Now, we are facing another surge in numbers, and we must address them as soon as possible. The Quezon City government, in coordination with the national government through the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases and the Department of Health, has long been preparing for the arrival of vaccines. As early as November 2020, when the city was still handling many cases, we have already allocated 1 billion pesos budget for our vaccination program. Thanks to our city council, this budget is currently being used to acquire vaccines, hire additional healthcare workers, and purchase other necessary medical supplies. So far, we have sealed the deal with AstraZeneca through a tripartite agreement with the national government. Our allocation of AstraZeneca is currently at 1.1 million doses, which will cover two shots for 550,000 individuals. I also signed Executive Order Number 44, Series of 2020, which established the Task Force Vax to Normal, which will create and organize the Quezon City COVID-19 vaccine plan and oversee and ensure the expeditious and orderly acquisition and distribution of vaccines in the city. The Task Force Vax created the framework, which included supply and cold chain management, immunization, data management, and also communication. With the collaboration of different city government departments, these four areas will harmonize in order to create a successful immunization path. We have heard from the experts that we need to achieve herd immunity by inoculating at least 70% of our population, listing down all our priority groups, which include frontline workers, senior citizens, persons with comorbidities, other essential workers, and indigent population. Our priority list is at 1,066,000 individuals. That's a lot, yes, but our pursuit is to make sure these individuals will receive their two doses of vaccines as soon as possible. Aside from our records of workers and members of sectors, we also launched the QCID system to better record individuals who must be part of the priority list. This system will also be integrated with our partner Zwilig Pharma's EasyVax, which will help us monitor all our vaccine recipients from their pre-vaccination to post-vaccination. As of March 22, more than 217,000 have registered in our ID, which also provided us with their insight on the vaccination path. 39.02% said yes, they are willing to be vaccinated, while 37.57% are undecided. The rest, 23.40%, said they are not willing to be vaccinated. This is still one of the major hurdles that we need to address. How can we convince our people that vaccination is important, not just for their safety, but for their families as well? Through the communication arm of our task force, the QC Protect Todo sa Makunang Sigurado campaign was created. This is our vaccine confidence campaign which aims to promote awareness and facilitate decision-making with trusted community voices and medical experts. Our communication plan included social media posts, Zoom conferences, and webinars with experts, posters, flyers, pins, and other materials that will support our information dissemination campaign. A toolkit was also disseminated to our 142 barangays, which contain posters, flyers, and localized presentations. Facebook remains to be one of our leading communication platforms. To reach out to our Q citizens who are on Facebook, we launched the 
program sa totoo lang, webinar series to answer the questions and concerns of many residents. In our vaccination rollout, we partnered with Zwilig Pharma to ensure its success. Our supply chain process is compliant with the standards set by the World Health Organization. So from purchasing to delivery, to planning and scheduling, to its transportation to Quezon City, up until the inoculation and the monitoring and surveillance, all these will be following all protocols and standards. We have identified 24 possible vaccination sites and we are already preparing them for the arrival of the vaccines. All in all, 80% of our QC residents are above 15 years old and can receive vaccines. That is 1.6 million individuals. Ideally, we will be able to cover all of them if we can vaccinate 8,400 people per day in the 24 vaccination sites. Yes, it will be very challenging, but we are determined to fight COVID-19 through vaccination. As the leader of the biggest city in Metro Manila, the safety and the protection of my people fall on my shoulders. This responsibility will be met with different hurdles and challenges, but I will remain resolute in our mission. I will not let my people down nor disregard the hardships they continue to face up to this day. Through the help of my team in the Quezon City government, our private sector partners, and also the national government, we will ensure that few citizens will achieve herd immunity. I am confident that through the cooperation of our people, we will focus on our mission. We will achieve the goals we have set, and we will see the end of this battle. To all of you, join us in making sure that all our wishes against this virus will become realities. Your cooperation in making sure all your family and community members follow basic health protocols is already a big help in stopping this virus. I'm sure we all look forward to the day that we can get to hug our relatives, see our friends, and enjoy the great outdoors soon, hopefully very soon. For now, let's mask up wash our hands, and socially distance ourselves. Maraming salamat po. Thank you to Mayor Joy and her staff for accommodating our request to share their updates on their vaccination program. As she said, it's going to be, it will be a very daunting task, but uh, we heard it from her. She's reassuring all, all our constituents. Okay, I think. I sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so to continue sure. with our next, it happens. <laughs> this technology thing. He holds our next panelist uh, holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering and a master in business administration degree. He has more than thirty years of professional experience, half of which have been devoted to government service, specifically with the Bureau of Philippine Standards of the Department of Trade and Industry. He was a technical manager of SGS Regional Headquarters, sharing his expertise on information security management system, standardization, accreditation, certification, testing, and compliance to international st standards such as ISO and IEC. He is currently the president of the National Committee of the Philippines of the International Electrotechnical Commission, a former national president of the Institute of Electronics Engineers of the Philippines, and was the founding vice president of the Philippine Association Association of Government Electronics Engineers. He is a professional electronics engineer and an ASEAN engineer, and he is currently the director of the Cybersecurity Bureau of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. Friends, is all welcome, Director Jose Carlos Caloy Reyes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes, uh, my colleague before in DICT. A good day to everyone. First and foremost, I would like to thank the CIO, CIOF, especially its officers, for inviting me as one of the panelists for today's undertaking. It is indeed an honor to join you this morning. 
as the country continues to battle the unseen enemy, which is COVID-19, the government is continuously ramping up its efforts to address the national health emergency. The Department of Information and Communications Technology, the government's executive branch mandated to enforce national ICT plans and programs has been tasked to manage the Philippines Vaccination Information Management System. Next, please. The Data Resiliency for Ease of Access and Management, which is the Dream Team, was created by virtue of the IATF IED Resolution Number 85, which is composed of the Department of Information and Communications Technology as the Chair, the Department of Information and Local Government, Department of Health, the Department of Science and Technology, the Philippine National Police, and the Armed Forces of the Philippines and other agencies as may deem appropriate to deploy build capacity and competency of its resources and monitor the use of ICT solutions that are part of the official COVID-19 ecosystem. Next, please. Recognizing the need for a seamless vaccination rollout, the DICT, including its regional cluster offices, ensures that all local government units and designated vacuna centers encodes the required information in the system before and after the vaccines are administered to recipients in the collaboration with the Dream Team member agencies. Next, please. As we continue to battle COVID-19, another unseen enemy continues to threaten our national uh, ecosystems, specifically our critical information infrastructure. In light of this, the DICT through the Cybersecurity Bureau has continuously ramped it up its cybersecurity frontline services amidst the pandemic. Cybersecurity advocacy programs continues to be conducted online all throughout the country through our clusters, critical information infrastructure evaluation, and cybersecurity standards monitoring continues. In fact, we recently concluded this month a series of cybersecurity policy and cert trainings or computer emergency response team trainings for all the 12 critical information infrastructure identified sectors in the Philippines. We also issue digital certificates through our Philippine National PKI, which is being used right now by uh, most of all government officials to issue permits and licenses and all government instrumentalities. We even issued some private indi individuals, uh, this uh, Philippine National PKI issued a digital signatures for government services. Other services that we have do, been doing during this uh, period is the vulnerability assessment and penetration testing for government entities, which is for free, and the continuous operation of the Philippine National Security Operations Center through the National Computer Emergency Response Team of the Philippines. Next, please. This is a challenging time for our nation, not only in the realm of the public health, but also in security of our critical information infrastructure. It is in this light that the DICT Cybersecurity Bureau stands firm in its mandate to work towards cyber resiliency for everyone and for the whole nation. In behalf of the DICT, we wish everyone a good safe and secure day. Maraming salamat po at magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Thank you, Director Engineer Kaloy, and we are assured that uh, you will support this vaccination program through your critical um, inputs and uh, hopefully programs on cybersecurity. So we'll have Q&A later, so if uh, those participating in our um, session today, please uh, you can post your questions and we can read them later. Um, next uh, on, on our panel is an experienced technology officer with demonstrated history of working in the computer software industry, skilled in startups, leadership, strategic planning, strategy, and problem solving. He is a strong information technology professional with an executive program focused in creating collaborative solutions and innovations in governance 
from Harvard Kennedy School. Prior to his uh, current posting in Microsoft, he was the former undersecretary and CIO of the Department of Budget and Management of the Philippines from 2011 to 2016. A dear colleague from CIOF before, where he was involved in an interagency committee to ensure the effective development and implementation of the government integrated financial management information system and the national payroll system. He has also participated in various activities and reforms to make government data more transparent and accessible. Friends, it's all welcome the National Technology Officer of Microsoft Philippines, Sir Richard Bon Moya. Sir? Thank you very much, Assistant Director Agnes. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, there we go. Uh, the introduction will probably be longer than what I will have to say. And uh, I, I, I apologize in advance for ambient noises. I will just live in a small condo and uh, there are lots of constructions uh, going around. So let me start. And I'll be talking about policy considerations for our national vaccine endeavor. I share this perspective in the spirit of continuing of community knowledge, sharing between as a participant in our common societal mission. And I am encouraged by what I have heard from my favorite USEC, USEC Rosario Berhere, and the other participants on how we are progressing. So let us begin with the end in mind. In this massive, unprecedented, and critical national endeavor, what does success look like? In my mind, it should look like this, that number one, in the most efficient and effective way, every Filipino would be given credible protection from the coronavirus. Number two, that Filipinos can immediately resume productive activities. And finally, that in a future similar crisis, the country can react more proactively and quickly. For this to happen, the following policies must be present. First, a policy to obtain clear, concise, and credible information on who gets what, where, when, in real time. In this day and age of uh, knowing what your friends and relatives are eating or what they're wearing, waiting for critical life-saving information is unforgivable. If we can track our food orders in real time, we should be able to track our critical assets in real time. If legislation for a vaccine passport is to be made operational, relevant and credible inoculation data must flow from the clinics, hospitals, and health centers to the certifying bodies. The latency of the flow of data must never get in the way of citizens' legitimate activity and right to travel. The information system must have the capability for knowledge-based forecasting and automated reporting to local, regional, and national agencies related to the vaccination progress. It must be able to immediately capture data of potential side effects from the vaccine. Next, a policy to attain a complete and integrated view of the operational landscape. Imagine the chaos when information on citizens vaccinated by local government units, individual private organizations, and the national government remain isolated from each other. The policy should leverage existing data systems and interoperability standards to facilitate rapid implementation at the lowest cost possible. A pervasive feedback mechanism should be put in place to complete the information loop from various data sources to guarantee system relevance and data relevance, of course. Interoperability must be mandated by the authorities. Third, a policy that promotes trust in the system. Trust is essential to ensure community support in the whole endeavor. Security, privacy, and compliance are non-negotiable characteristics of any platform used. Our right to health must go hand in hand with our right to privacy. To do this, encryption of data at rest and in transit must be guaranteed. Critical personal information must always be given with consent and must be used only for the purpose intended. Next, and this is important, a clear policy on accountability. The government must designate a clear and institutional entity to manage and operate the vaccine system. While patently a technical endeavor, it must be operations led to ensure alignment of intended outcomes with the system. This institution must have enforcement powers necessary to ensure compliance and respond effectively. This institution must be properly resourced in terms of technology, manpower, skills, and equipment. The country's vaccination program should not be ad hoc in character and should be organized, resourced, and empowered for the long haul. And finally, a policy to acquire purpose-driven solutions designed for a fair, equitable, and efficient procurement and distribution of the vaccine. 
We need a secure and interoperable platform that balances the complexities of the registration, scheduling, supply chain distribution, with the broader public health mission to deliver a safe and effective vaccine in a prioritized manner. And then finally, a cloud-based solution considers the fragmented nature of our archipelago, the persistent disruption brought about by natural calamities, and the global, uh, distribution, uh, global distribution of our citizens, as manifested by our speaker father from the U.S. In closing, let me draw you to our archipelago, 7,641 islands. It might make for a beautiful country to live in, but not so for mission critical system. We must put in place a whole of society, real time, borderless solution to a problem that is also borderless, real time, and disruptive of the whole society. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you, Sir Bon, and uh, for sharing with us this policy imperatives. Hopefully, we can uh, delve deeper later on. But we agree, it's it's it has to be a whole of society approach. We need collaboration and trust in how we combat this pandemic. So, thank you, Sir Bon. Later, uh, hopefully, we can open more questions under our Q and A. So, we move now to our next panelist uh, from the medical field as well as from the business is a first Philip, known as the first Filipino health retailer in the private sector, backed by, by his outstanding credentials in various entrepreneurship ventures. And um, he, in 20, 2006, he chaired the Philippines' first health and wellness tourism, The Next Frontier, showcasing the Philippines' readiness towards becoming a significant player in the rapidly growing tourism subsector. Um, sadly, we know that um, tourism was affected by the pandemic, but hopefully we can recover soon. He was invited to various medical tourism travel conferences in Hawaii, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur to talk about Philippine initiatives championing Quezon City's trust as health and wellness hub in the Philippines. After 10 years of intuitive entrepreneurship, he obtained his MBA degree at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business, where he conceptualized and executed yet another pioneering venture in retirement long-term services, the wellness place, professional care homes. He founded MediServe, as a, in 1992, as a laboratory offering specialty tests to doctors and clinics nationwide, and Clinica Manila in 1994, the first comprehensive mall-based healthcare facility in the country, he is the chair and CEO of One Health Network and Healthcare Business Development Partners Holdings, a serial entrepreneur from the medical field, Dr. Hernando De Liso. Sir, doctor? Hello. Uh, uh, good morning to all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I thank the CIOF for giving me the privilege to be part of this milestone event. I come from a perspective of a clinician of over 30 years, an industry player, uh, provider of care. I'm in the grassroots as well as uh, in the midst of innovation in delivering health care for the Filipino people especially on the preventive health care. Now, next slide, please. Uh, the whole of the nation or the whole of the society approach, which connotes inclusiveness, must be able to address the whole of the person or the targeted population or community. Preventive, connected health care must be effective. One bad story, of course, uh, from even on the ground, can actually derail uh, our well-planned supposed uh, vaccination program. So I, I am an advocate for a patient system base that has an IT platform that would address the most elemental items, but must be able to address the likely biggest issues of the targeted population. Connected healthcare is an essential component of this. Next slide, please. So this is an example of uh, a on the ground private initiative on our response on uh, the vaccination program. So we are participating and hopefully participate in a master listing in on the ground by way of the targeted population. As an industry player, my primary interest is on the enterprise or the private sector, knowing fully that they are the engine of economic growth. So there you go, 
that there are processes that are in place and supposedly in place in an ideal ICT platform. But I'd like you to really be more uh, focused on the fact that there has to be uh, not just percentages or actually numbers of increase and decrease, but an actually uh, an intention and or an intervention to really uh, address real time the concerns of uh, people. So you're talking about one person, one, one, one community that would actually be affected. And of course, you'd be able to uh, address and bring about the whole of nation resources to this particular targeted population. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this actually all include uh, what is actually in place in as far as the, the vaccination program and process that has been developed by the National Vaccination Program and it's integrated in the platform. Ideally, this should always be part of it because it is important in, as stated by uh, 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 Secretary uh, Yusek Berhere, that there has to be an attempt and has to be a real data analysis of those who have actually have uh, an adverse event following immunization. And therefore, there should be a real-time capacity to address these particular events and intervene to this targeted population. I always emphasize the word targeted. Next slide, please. So uh, I would say that these are the desired features and benefits, the end-to-end -end management of a targeted population. And in particular, of course, these are, uh, in my sense, because as a geriatrician, the, uh, the economic frontliners, other than, of course, following the uh, uh, healthcare frontliners, are the uh, elderly. I have particular interest because today, I, my friend who's 66 years old just died of COVID infection, who had diabetes, who had obesity, and who had uh, kidney failure. And also yesterday, I had a, a teleconsult with a 91-year-old asking for uh, if they are safe to have vaccination. These are the hurdles that I, as a clinician and industry player, are faced with. But of course, we're ready to, to, to hurdle this together with the government stakeholders and other partners uh, in the uh, ICT. Next slide. So uh, we should actually be, through the platform, we should be able to really uh, do preventive daily medical question and health indicators because I'm an advocate that eventually and ultimately personal health care is the start of total health care. So patient consultations should be available prescription, and intervention. And of course, it should integrate the uh, COVID vaccine program rollout and the post-immunization follow-up. And you have the capability to receive health advisories in as far as this targeted population. And in particular, the enterprises and institutions, private and public, should have access to actionable information. And of course, this should be updated from time to time. Next slide. And thank you, of course, for the fact that we should actually take ICT as a warm embrace for the whole of nation approach to the whole of the well-being of the person and targeted population. It should actually be something that is not just basically monitoring, but actually caring. That is my perspective as a clinician on the ground and an industry player. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions later. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Deliso, uh, for sharing us the, your experience as a clinician and industry player really grounded um, on the grassroots and um, believing that ICT should work in how we combat this pandemic. So later on, we'll um, raise more questions. But Thank you so much. We now move to our next um, speaker. He's currently, he currently leads the Converge ICT Solutions Drive for Innovation to en enable new ways of business, collaboration, and productivity. Prior to joining Converge, he has held senior leadership positions in KMaya, SM Investments, Bayan Telecom, Sky Cable, LBC Express, Tau Group, and Marsman Drysdale Corporation. He has led IT and engineering initiatives with nationwide and international business operations 
in the areas of investment management, fintech, telecom, and cable television, logistics, okay. and remittance, FMCG, okay. and retail estate conglomerate. Friends, it's all welcome. The Chief Information okay. Officer of Converge ICT Solutions, Mr. and Engineer Ulysses Nagit. Um, did you um, hear me po? Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, yes, Agnes. Yes, I, I can turn over you. na po to the Chief Information Officers, Converge ICT Solutions. All right. Good morning. Um, can you hear me, Agnes? Yes, right now I can hear you po. All right. Um, Unang-una, uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, sana po ay nasa mabuti tayong kalagayan kasama ng ating mga mahal sa buhay. Pang pangalawa, um, maraming salamat sa CIO Forum for the invitation to participate and contribute to this program. Um, my name is Yuli and I am from Converge. For our conversation today, I would like to share our thoughts on the continuing importance of having an inclusive and reliable connectivity, especially at this time. Um, last year, uh, we know that it has been marked as the greatest period of uncertainty and economic volatility that our generation has ever faced. I still remember because I was invited last year as well. Uh, one of our conversation during that time, it was centered on how the virus threatened and affected all of us, our health, our lives, and even our livelihoods. And we acknowledge that technology and connectivity played a major role in adapting to new normal. Last month, the first batch of coronavirus vaccines arrived in the country and uh, followed by another batch after a week. As the national rollout plan comes into sight based on the survey done by uh, one organization recently, there is a very high desire to learn more about everything. So what we mean with that, uh, many from us would like to know uh, more about the vaccine development. Many of us would like to know the rollout plan, the side effects, the proper dosage, even the legitimacy of procurement process. This only shows there is a continuing need to grow education on vaccines across different channels and format. Many of us here in this session understand the value of vaccine, but if there is a big number of Filipinos who are expressing apprehension, I think it was mentioned by Father Astriaco earlier, and they do not feel they are ready to be vaccinated unless others will go ahead. It is because with the unknown comes uncertainty. So what can be done to help combat misinformation? Uh, to name some, um, we know that trusted member of even a small circle of people sometimes weighs more heavily than the advice of professionals. It was also mentioned by Father earlier, influencer network can help vouch for vaccines safety. So why not allow them to help co spearhead and harness their influence through all available channels, especially the social media for information dissemination? Whether we like it or not, we are still going to be living with this pandemic for at least another year or at least until vaccine is widely available. So whether it is testing, contact tracing, survey feedback, even incident reporting where outbreaks are happening, inoculation, the tracking of critical information and the use of data analytics. So when we say data analytics, I'm sure everybody's familiar when we say descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. This information should be enabling our leaders to react quickly and help them to be in a position to formulate the appropriate response for different situations. 
with public and private institutions coming together to combat the spread of COVID-19 across the country and around the world, continuous flow of good communications is, I'm sure all of us will agree, is of utmost importance. So whether it is information dissemination because we don't want the fake news to prosper, the data tracking, good flow of communications, an inclusive and reliable connectivity will always play an important role for us to get through this pandemic and safeguard the next generations to come. And with this, Converge as one of the largest end-to-end high-speed fiber broadband provider in the country, and we subscribe to a Go National strategy, we are already on our way to complete the national fiber backbone to link the islands, uh, not just Luzon, but also besides in Mindanao, by a submarine cables to serve millions of households and businesses in the farthest region of our country to provide an inclusive and reliable internet for the Filipinos. With this slide, we would like to end our conversation uh, prior to the panel uh, later, that Converge is one with the ICT for the vaccination program because among other things, we believe it is essential to our economic recovery as a nation. Muli, marami pong salamat sa inyo lahat. Thank you, Engineer Ulysses Nagit, the Chief Information Officers of Converge ICT Solutions. Sir, I'm, I'm reminded that, that we really need reliable internet connectivity. I think I've been disconnected like four times. And I'm pretty sure you're not our ISP. <laughs> 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 so um, taking off from, from your discussion, mm. it's really important on the info dissemination, on data analytics, and of course, government, private sector, even academic collaboration, as you said, on how we will overcome this very challenging um, pandemic. So um, we move now to our um, Q&A. But before that, I think I was um, I was on mute when I was uh, trying to acknowledge uh, our thanks to Mayor Joy and her staff for really, um, you know, putting in effort po to, to record that message to us and their updates on their vaccination program. She actually also recorded some responses to, to some questions we posted. So um, for the first question, let me just uh, read it out. And um, later on, we'll play uh, the response of uh, Mayor jo Joy. And we also request our four other um, panelists to also please respond to this question. So here it is. We are sure that there are efforts to combat disinformation and fake news about the country's vaccination program to inspire higher public confidence. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is the highest, how do you rate the government's information campaign in this regard? What do you plan or recommend the government should do to make its information campaign on the vaccination program more effective? But before we ask our panelists, uh, let's uh, please play uh, the response of Mayor Joy. JC, thank you. Well, vaccine hesitancy was really high a few months back before vaccines became available and before we had started the inoculation program. But now that vaccines are slowly coming in and doctors and other health workers have been vaccinated, the confidence of our people in vaccines has dramatically gone up. But honestly, out of 10, I would give the national government's information campaign a 7. What we were expecting was for medical experts from both the national government and the private sector to discuss the merits of vaccination and how this would protect us from contracting the disease and the, from infecting others. But instead, the initial discussions and communication efforts focused on the different vaccine brands and became an issue of where they were manufactured, whether they were Western or Chinese. This kind of messaging affected the people's opinions and perceptions on vaccines in the wrong way, as far as I see it. This created an uninformed, baseless bias in the minds of our people. To contribute to proper information dissemination on vaccines, the communication arm of our task force created the QC Protect Todo sa Bakunang Sigurado campaign. This vaccine confidence campaign was aimed at promoting awareness and facilitating decision making through information given to to us by trusted community voices uh, such as um, influencers and people who had already been vaccinated. And, and medical experts as well. 
Facebook was our leading communication platform. To reach out to our Q citizens who are on Facebook, we launched a program, sa totoo lang, webinar series, to answer the many questions and concerns about vaccination of our many residents. And I think this helped our residents get a better idea of how vaccines work and why brands are not really that important. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can we ask Dr. Deliso to comment or respond to our to the question raised? Dr. Deliso, please. All right. Now, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, in course, the if I may rate it, uh, well, I would rate it at plus six. Uh, However, what I see as a more credible or more trusty, trustworthy sources for a vaccination campaign would be the professionals. To that effect, uh, I, I'm proud to say that the societies, especially societies, are the ones who are actually spearheading this. In fact, I see our uh, colleagues posting that they are being vaccinated. So it's the national societies that are actually being more taken as a positive source of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, influence. Uh, unfortunately, they were, uh, which I'll probably answer later on in, in the next questions, there were variations in terms of uh, experiences in the actual vaccination. But nonetheless, there are many comments later on. But uh, I see that doctors have become the more effective uh, influencers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deliso. May we ask Sir Bon? Sir Bon Moya, please. Well, I take a different perspective. Uh, truth is not a government problem. Truth is a societal problem. And therefore, the ones responsible for making sure that we get the right information is the society, not the government. But in terms of a viable uh, communication suggestion, you know, elections are really important to us. And every election, especially a national election, the whole government and societal mechanisms come together to start this uh, dynamic of spreading information about who's running, when they're running, the election, what you need to do. We have done it before. I think if we can do that same endeavor where uh, uh, private media, private uh, uh, media practitioners, government uh, assets, and government uh, uh, and still come together to, if we can do that, I think that's the solution because it is really more important than a national election. And if we can just make our endeavors close to that activity, it should make a difference. Sir Mon, we're taking a poll. Sir Mon, out of 1 to 10, we're taking a poll. What is your response? 1 to 10. I, I don't think it will be a fair assessment on my part to, to Personal lang po. make an assessment. Huh? Personal? <laughs> uh, I'd rather not. I just need to say that, again, back to the, the framing is, of the question. Sige nga, maraming uh, for improvement. <laughs> it's a societal endeavor. And if you need to, and if we need to grade ourselves, we need to grade ourselves as a society, not, not just as government. Noted, sir. So let's move to our other uh, panelists. Uh, Director Kaloy. Yeah, thank you very much. I share the same thoughts with uh, you said one, no? I would rather not to rate it. Though I'll be focusing on the uh, advocacy that what we are doing in the Department of ICT, specifically the Cybersecurity Bureau, that everybody would be uh, aware of this uh, fake news and disinformation and we have been uh, informing everybody through our uh, advocacy uh, page that all news uh, uh, the society needs to consider and seek out information from a range of credible sources. They need to think before they share this information. They need to check and confirm the published date and time. They also need to check what's the news out that published it and also consider who is the author. So from then on, we need to be wise and sometimes common sense needs to be adopted. 
if we will be uh, listening to fake news if we, uh, and uh, disinformation. Thank you very much. Director Kaloy, may checklist pala kayo. Nakapost ba to, yung mga to? Are they posted somewhere, yung checklist mo? Yes, we'll be, uh, we have been sharing this one in our advocacy page. We'll be sharing this one uh, once we submit uh, already on uh, our uh, Facebook page. Yes, please. We will So that we can also share. Thank you. Okay, let's move to Engineer Ulysses Nagit. Sir, baka mas bold si sir. Meron siyang rating. Sir, Engineer Yuli. Oh, hello. I was yes, sir, go ahead. We can hear you now. <laughs> Okay, I already mentioned the number, so I think you miss it. <laughs> okay, Ulitin natin, um, sir. Ulitin natin. Out of okay. 10. Okay. Um, I agree with Bon. Uh, this is not for the governance rating, but for all of us, because uh, it should be a societal rating. So um, there are many areas for improvement, but what we would like to say is we commend the government in the efforts to educate the public about the benefits of vaccination. However, uh, what we can do, and each of us and every company, is to assist in any way we can. So for Converse, what we are trying to do, uh, we are running a campaign right now for our own version of vaccination program. We are identifying uh, the employees who are interested, and we are opening also the program to their dependents, to the immediate family. Um, we are also coordinating with uh, external vendors uh, for the inoculation and we're training our own people. We have doctors and nurses also in, in our organization for, for the same activity. So um, that's probably what we can uh, share. Uh, running the education campaign for our own employees uh, to make an informed decision is very important for us. So that's what we can contribute for this. Um, thank you, sir. From the private sector's perspective, meron na kayong mga plans on the mapping who gets to 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 undergo yung vaccine. So I'll go to um, another questions that we have. Unless po with our audience, do we have any question that is uh, posted po para sa ating mga panelists? If not, I I will proceed with the second question. And um, si Dr. Deliso po ang request ko muna dito. Right now, it seems many people are still unclear as to who among should be or would get the vaccine. There are rumors that those aged 80 and above are advised not to be inoculated. When B, when they would be informed on the schedule of the vaccines and where they would go to get the vaccine shots. Ano po yung thoughts dito ni Dr. Deliso? Uh, hello? Yes, yes, I think. Yes, Doc. Uh, all right. Uh, let me just open this. Thank you very much again for this particular question. Uh, there, there are two things that I like to see. Uh, one, uh, there. well, I can now talk about the actual experience. There were actually problems with the uh, vaccination rollout in different places. Uh, one city has chaotic uh, vaccination. The other one is systematic, but they're not even sure who to vaccinate. Uh, so this is a real, real issue. If you talk about as a clinician, uh, every adult should be vaccinated. All right. So including the ones 80. However, however, there is a qualification. Those with comorbidities with medications will have to be really uh, be aware that they have to be uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, guided by their physician so the local government is the only source of uh, uh, vaccination at the moment uh, right now it's, they just have rolled out for the healthcare frontliners the seniors are coming in but even the vaccination for healthcare workers are having problems so to answer the question, uh, they are unfortunately uh, I don't want, I want I don't want to mention uh, cities. There really is a disconnect. There are gaps in terms of information on two on two on two uh, grounds: uh, where to vaccinate 
and who to vaccinate. Um, so a lot of areas on for improvement po sa, sa dito, no? Doctor? Yes, 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 yes. Ah, Kasi biglang okay. bu- 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 nagdatingan eh. Sa, in fact, many places are just been notified the day before na andito na pala yung vaccine. No? So parang ganun. So, uh, well, I, I saw one city being very systematic. One is, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I don't know why. Uh, it has been chaotic. But okay. to the question that who should be vaccinated all adults, excepting for those who really have severe illnesses and those who have uh, severe uh, active comorbidities. What about po itong sabi nilang rumor na to that those age to 80 and above are advised not to be inoculated? Well, as a geriatrician, uh, the problem with over 80, there is really a problem of immune response. All right? So, it can go okay. uh, both ways. So it's something that I said as a geriatrician, up to 80, that would be no question. Over 80, they need to be yeah. guided by their uh, clinicians. Oh, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, Actually, we have a response from Quezon City Mayor, Mayor Joy, on our question. JC, can you run it and let's see the perspective of, of the LGU on this question? Thank you. We get information from the national government as this arrives. And we are very strict about following the guidelines set by the IATF and the national agencies involved in the vaccination program, like the National Task Force as well. First of all, our priority sectors are based on the list given to us by the Department of Health and the World Health Organization. And with regards to guidelines, um, the national government is very explicit about these guidelines. For example, when they were discussing Sinovac or Coronavac, they, um, they, they said that this was just for 18 to 59-year-olds and that if there are senior citizens who want to be vaccinated with this uh, particular vaccine, they will need to sign a waiver. This was a clear guideline on their end, but uh, did this not trickle down to the people? So we in the local government unit, our job was to make sure that we intensify our social media campaign to, to um, make sure that the people are well informed about these various guidelines. Um, with regards to the second issue about the schedules and where and when to get the vaccines, we partnered with Zwilig Pharma, who um, sent electronic messages to our citizens who are registered with the QCID in order to get their schedule of vaccination and also to be told where uh, to get these vaccinations from among our 24 inoculation sites. So hopefully um, our, um, in, our independent uh, communications um, campaign and social media platforms and campaigns will be able to, inten- to intensify the various uh, guidelines that we receive from the national government. Um, yes, thank you for for playing that, we we do know that um, QC is one of the hotbeds in terms of yung mga infections on COVID. And um, I think we have LGUs also present here. So if you need us to link to you with how the QC government is working towards their vaccination program, do um, email us at the CIOF forum. So let's move to... Do we have questions from the floor? If none, I, I, I have questions. Meron po ba tayo from the floor? So again, this is um, the perspective po ng LGU and private companies. We hear news of LGUs and private companies themselves directly negotiating or even having already contracted the supply of vaccines for their constituents in the case of the LGUs or their employees in the case of private companies. First, if this are really happening, how, how are those in charge of implementing the National Vaccination Program Plan to coordinate these different initiatives to ensure the priority are to those who need the most, particularly health workers and other frontliners as planned, and put order in what is happening to ensure the overall success of the vaccination program? Um, Siguro for the government ito, uh, and hopefully with our private sector partner, maybe you can share with us like see Dr. Deliso, is there a centralized vaccine supply management system in place? Can we ask the, from our Microsoft friends, Sir Bon, paano po yung sa inyong um, vaccination program for, your, for Microsoft? Uh, well, um, 
there, I, I don't have a clear answer. My clear answer is, should there be a centralized repository of information? The answer is yes, there should be. Is there one now? My understanding is the ICT is in charge to build that one. Is it running? It's not visible to me. Uh, I do understand that some private sectors like Astra have their own system. My understanding is this system is not yet integrated to the national system, which is still being uh, built. So, so I think that's where we are. Microsoft is a platform. We don't have a vaccine system per se. We have a vaccine architecture. We have a platform that can help bring this, uh, bring uh, everything in. Uh, so uh, my, my, my concern really is that there are systems being uh, propounded and run in the local government. There are systems being run and propounded in the private sector. Uh, and uh, eventually, there will be a national system uh, using the ICT. So all of those need to come together. They need to have an understanding this early about how to make all of this come together. Otherwise, we will end up with, like many other systems in our archipelago, uh, confusion because they imagine if you get a data set from your LGU, subsidized by the LGU, and then someone tells you, oh, the national government, you're entitled for another vaccine. And then you also get a vaccine because we, we we are not able to determine that you already have your vaccination. So I think we should avoid that problem. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but the challenge for we're, 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 we're these are like systems in silos, and we cannot get data analytics if this is the kind of environment we have. So hopefully we move towards the integration the soonest. And uh, let me ask for let's see, Doctor Deliso, based on your experience, what? Paano po yun? Because you're already implementing itong sa vaccination program. Kanina po yan nasasabit? Uh, right now, I, I'm sadly, uh, there are no data to speak of uh, at the moment because right now, just today, as we, I, as I speak, all of our staff at Clinica Mel is undergoing vaccination by the local government. So at the moment, it's only the local government that is actually in place. But of course, we know that there are initiatives by big companies that are actually procuring but again, it's my understanding under the tripartite agreement, it is directed towards the employees, of those who are actually procuring, on condition that half of their procurement will have to be given to government. That has not happened yet. That's not happening yet. So I would have an assumption that because these private companies are willing to spend for their employees for their own productivity, but then on condition that uh, the other half or 50 percent of procurement will go to the government that has not arrived yet there's none yet right okay. now the uh, uh, vaccines that are in place are coming from the lgus but they are limited at this level only for uh, healthcare frontliners because we are a clinic we are uh, being given but the next level i don't know yet when it will come Okay, so we hope we get further guidance nga po from IATF and DOH. Um, Engineer Yuli, you already mentioned how you're doing it sa, sa, sa level ninyo. Ganun din po ba experience, Dr. Deliso? Um, well, um, for Converse, um, what we can share is we are pleased to uh, announce that we are having tripartite agreement uh, with the government, with the private sector, and uh, the vaccine manufacturer to provide the vaccine for, for us. So we are one with the government. Uh, we're closely collaborating with the OH and the rest of the business community uh, so that um, we can provide the vaccines uh, to our employees and to their immediate families. And um, also I plan to provide uh, uh, donation to like-minded organizations. So we're working on those uh, areas, right? Thank you, Engineer Yuli. And um, Engineer Kaloy, I know you're focused on cybersecurity, but uh, it, this is also an important element, lalo na sa data breaches, mga securities, no? Can you elaborate more on how ICT sees this? Kasi nga, when the discussion is, there are so many systems, tapos uh, in silos pa, and uh, knowing that uh, overall, the ICT talaga dapat sa ICT infra natin. Um, are there any developments? Yes, actually the BIMS interim uh, system is in place, so this will be launched uh, next Sunday. Uh, though this is a uh, project of a different uh, group under the DICT, 
the director informed me that they'll be partnering with a third party on this one. And uh, this uh, vaccine supply management system is included in this uh, VIMS. So in essence, uh, Cyber Security Bureau has, has done uh, vulnerability assessment and penetration system penetration testing on this system. And uh, together with the National Privacy Commission who's been doing the compl uh, compliance in terms of privacy. So uh, rest assured that the uh, DIC in partnership with NPC is uh, in partnership with the uh, security and privacy issues on this uh, VIMS. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the reassurance, uh, Director Kaloy. I would like to run the reply uh, response of Mayor Joy to this question. Please, on question three. Local governments are allowed to enter into negotiations with um, some pharmaceutical companies in order to order supplies for our uh, citizens. These supplies are supposed to be a buffer to those that will be supplied to us by the national government. Um, now, in the case of Quezon City, we entered into an agreement, and this is a tripartite agreement, uh, with AstraZeneca and the national government for 1.1 million doses, which is good for 550,000 people. I stress tripartite because local government units are not allowed to um, purchase uh, vaccines for our people without the blessings and the participation of the national government because these vaccines are um, under emergency use authority only and not for commercial sale. Now, with regards to making sure that we are um, not vaccinating the same people or that there is order in the way that we vaccinate, we have a comprehensive database of all of our people and uh, this database enables us to keep track of all of those who are who are vaccinated with a supply given by the national government and then those who will be vaccinated with the supply that will be purchased uh, by the local government through the tripartite agreement yes thank you so it seems that they have they have a base management system in place and um, we'll move to another question I think that I would like to particularly ask uh, Sir Mon and Mon Sir Yuli, Engineer Yuli. Is the current ICT infrastructure adequate, responsive to the needs of the vaccination program? Is there nationwide connectivity? Is it reliable in terms of availability, adequacy, and security? How can cloud solutions leverage the integration, interoperability, and management systems and data for the vaccination program? Sir Mon? Sorry, Sir Bon. Ah, okay. Uh, well, my understanding is that as far as broadband access is concerned, more than half uh, the Philippine households have access to broadband. So, you know, considering where we started just two years ago, uh, that's a good uh, improvement. Is it enough? That means that half will not have. So that means we have to address half of them offline. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, interoperability, some critical things that we should have done before are not present. For example, unique identification per citizen. That's why the national ID or a uh, uh, digital version thereof would have been critical at this point. But it's not there, so we have to just uh, move forward. Uh, I think the bigger component is not that there are no technologies, because there are a dime a dozen, dalawa piso, ang, uh, available technology that can be rolled out. Uh, I think the problem is really uh, an integrated governance. So that uh, when we execute, execute nationally, we execute coordinatedly and we execute. Uh, so I think that that that's the component that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sir Sir Bon. Sir. Engineer Yuli, please. Okay. Uh, well, what I can uh, share on this uh, topic um, is... When we talk about vaccination program, let's try to put some framework first. Um, the vaccination program, if there is one system to cover everyone, or there are many systems uh, localized. So <clears throat> if the question is, um, do we have a good vaccination uh, system uh, that is running? So I think I, I cannot say there is, but if the question in relation to the connectivity 
is the next question. Remember, we have 110 million population. And if the size of the household's average is five uh, family members, we have 22,000 households. And as also mentioned by Bon, uh, more than half of the households are being covered already. And there are two ways how to connect to the system, assuming there is uh, an automated system. Or either you connect via wired or you connect via wireless. And the system that you are trying to access can be hosted um, here uh, on premise or it can be hosted in the cloud. So um, I, I guess if uh, when we talk about vaccination program, uh, I will agree to uh, the input also of Bond. Uh, it's the integration and interoperability with other systems to come up with the right information. So I think uh, without that kind of uh, roadmap or plan, uh, it's kind of hard to say that we have an effective vaccination system uh, being implemented right now. Uh, as a rejoinder, Engineer Yuli, sorry, putting you on spot. Um, you said po of our DOH kanina mentioned yung three M's niya. You think uh, it, there is already that roadmap or plan in place or may missing elements pa po? Were you able to... Um, um, if, if you are referring to the uh, topic earlier when there was a mention of national backbone and wireless, mm -mm. I think I think uh, I am referring to different uh, to different topic. I am saying that the vaccination program, if we're going to put a framework, there should be a system. Okay. And mm -hmm. there should be a way how to access the system. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that in accessing the system, uh, there are two ways. Either you use uh, wired uh, internet or wireless internet. So, um, and, and of course, there's a mention of cloud here. So what we can relate is that the vaccination system can be hosted on-prem or can be hosted on, be hosted on the cloud. cloud. But either but way, either way the, the bigger challenge there is the last mile on how to access the system. Okay. So okay. if we don't have uh, a system that can be connected to other system that produces the same information, mm -hmm. so you don't have a holistic view. That's the challenge for us. Okay. Okay, we got it. And I think articulated in po that kanina ni Dr. Deliso tong um, area for improvement or yung weakness natin. So we'd like to hear again from um, Mayor Joy on her response to question four. JC, please. In Quezon City, we have this policy of inoculating not only our residents, but also those who may not reside in Quezon City, but who may work or study in Quezon City. And we require everyone to register for a Quezon City ID card, either as a resident or, a re or they will have a resident ID card or a non-resident ID card. Now, this ID card and the information there is linked up to Zwilig Pharma's EasyVax system, which is a cloud-based system. No? And through the EasyVax system, additional questions will be asked to the, um, the citizen. For example, uh, questions pertaining to their health, their history, medical histories, etc., which will now help um, an assessor or a doctor uh, determine whether a patient should or should not be inoculated. No? So um, after that, uh, the Zwilig system um, also helps us to monitor the patient um, um, with regards to any after effects or side effects that this patient may be feeling even months after the inoculation. The uh, Zwilig system or the EasyVac system is also responsible for messaging electronically the patient to tell the patient um, when the second dose will be administered and where to go to get this second dose. The system as well of uh, Zwilig Pharma helps us to monitor um, all our vaccines from purchase to delivery to planning to scheduling to transportation to inoculation um, to all aspects of, of, the, pro of the program from uh, the arrival of the vaccines up to um, the um, disposal of the uh, the empty vials and the uh, syringes. No? So we in Quezon City use this system to make sure that all of the protocols and guidelines given to us by the national government are followed and adhered to. 
So, so we hear it, hear it has its own info system. Hopefully, it will be integrated to the national. We, are, we have a question posted to Microsoft and ICT Converge. How can Microsoft ICT Converge support the government and private efforts like One Health Telemedicine in the management of tracking COVID-19 immunization at the barangay level with a real-time connected a complete and integrated monitoring program. Um, this was a, a message posted to sa Facebook. Um, sir, sir Juan, you may want to address it or and and engineer Yuli afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for interest. Uh, thank you din sa mga nanood sa uh, FB. Uh, actually, sa totoo lang, sa, sa dami ng kulit ng Microsoft to assist, we're actually being told, relax lang kayo kung sabi kayo ang... Uh, Masyado kayo excited to participate. So we have to give space to those who need to decide so that they can decide properly. From, but technically, the answer is, I think the first order of the day, not just for Microsoft, but for all other uh, IT provider, we need to be credible, we need to be reliable, and we need to not represent. So when we say we will be up 24-7, we will be up. When we say we will be secure, we will be secure. Uh, and uh, make our platform available at the most economically viable portion. I think ideally you want to help and give it for free, but sometimes you really just need to uh, make it sustainable to make sure that you know there's a there's there's a proper economic recovery based on what's happening. So uh, that's the first one. We actually have been talking to anyone who wants to listen, CIO forum, logistics group, the government, uh, DICT, uh, AITF, uh, and, and we have uh, put our hand there and tell them even if just for uh, technical resource in terms of sourcing we can give that uh, in terms of platform we have our platform in terms of uh, database uh, integration we can also help them uh, they just need to call us we will be more than willing to be part of the solution uh, thank you sir Bon. of course we use microsoft in many of our business solutions and uh, we move to um, engineer yuli um, yes, uh, on the Converse side, um, yes, we are already uh, collaborating with different government agencies and LGU. So um, to give you some example, if one LGU needs a smart city kind of setup, so Converse is doing it, for, doing it already for some LGUs. So when we talk about um, the, I, the DICT programs, the three Ms, Actually, we're working closely, collabor collaborating closely with them. So we're trying to support their vision. That's why we have this uh, Go National concept uh, and also to support the last mile, whether wired or wireless. So we're working very, very closely with the uh, LGUs and with the uh, government agencies. Thank you, Engineer Yuli. Baka kailangan na kaming lumipat ng ISP. <laughs> Uh, thank you to uh, Engineer Kaloy for sharing the cybersecurity Facebook page nila po, the ICT. We have a question from Director Trish before we wrap up uh, our panel discussion. Director Trish? Hi, thank you, A.D. Agnes. Hello to our panelists. Thank you for your presentations. Um, siguro I'd like to direct this to the ICT Director Kaloy Reyes. And perhaps the doctor, um, uh, sorry, Deliso, Doctor Deliso, yes, Doctor Deliso also. Um, the question ko kasi is that we know that government is already rolling out the vaccination, in, um, rollout program, ano, for the private sector and then for its citizens. I wonder, merit mo bang programa or is there a system that will also parang um, implement naman the rollout within government agencies. The reason I ask this is because each government agency also will be taking care of its employees, di ba? Ako coming from the perspective na ako, sir, of a CIO uh, in BTI. So kami po, like in other government agencies here, Meron din ata, ata, and that's also still not validated kasi medyo malayo pa tayo dun sa vaccine priority release, di ba, as government employees. Pero is there a program po that the ICT will share with government agencies in terms of them using 
pag i-vaccinate na po yung mga empleyado nila or ang mangyayari po ba kanya-kanya kami pag-develop ng system? Yeah, 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 correct. No? Uh, we, we, we take also the view from the interagency task force. Uh, being myself the uh, chairman of the DICT uh, COVID task force in DICT, uh, we have not yet set yung ating uh, internal dito sa DICT on the uh, vaccination. But uh, if we have, uh, again, you, you made mention that uh, on the priority list, I think we are on the eighth or we are on the sixth uh, level, right? So, uh, in terms of this one, uh, I'm not quite sure if this would be integrated on sa VIMS, ano? Pero as of this date, uh, with all honesty, uh, sa DICT, we don't have yet any do sa vaccination protocols dito sa within the DICT. I'm not quite sure do sa ibang government agencies if they have already. Thank you. Thank you, Director Caloy. Makasi, okay. ano, uh, Dr. Deliso. Dr. Deliso? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, we are actually have a system that is, I would say, ready to go, ready to ready for roll out, whether private or uh, uh, public enterprise. Uh, in my presentation, I focus on the person and or targeted population. I said targeted because it, it, let us remember that the death rate of COVID is 1.5 percent. Mas marami pa rung namatay sa heart disease, diabetes, etc. So, ang ginawa ng platform is integrating the whole of the nation resources to the whole of the well-being of the person slash targeted community slash enterprise. Because we know that what would make the person susceptible or vulnerable for the complications of COVID are the non-communicable diseases. Hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, heart disease, obesity, etc. Kidney disease. As an internist who is also responsible for caring of this COVID, I've seen people die and, and live with COVID. So that platform, my perspective as a physician, is now being integrated using, of course, the aid of ICT so that we should be ready to, to assist any private or public enterprise. This, of course, uh, knowing for a fact that uh, there is a national healthcare program, with all due respect, it is late by way of supposed timeline because the supposed uh, platform as i read the national uh, vaccination program should have been ready to go as early as january 31. so that that being said we as private sector wanting to help have initiated this development but we are ready to interface interoperate with any government agency we are in talks with some LGUs to help them so that when they are ready to roll out this their vaccination program would be there. However, let me let me again answer the question that would a government agency wanting to roll out or a private agency? It looks like that would be the 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 intention of these tripartite agreements. No, of course we know the GoNegocio has purchased and given payment for seventeen million. Obviously directed towards their employees to be given for free. And I would uh, assume that there should be a development that would be able to monitor. It's not just monitoring, as I said earlier, it should be the care that should be felt on, on the platform. It's not basically monitoring statistics. There should be readiness to intervene on a case-to-case -case basis by way of, inter uh, I would say, problems because you can have a headache but not necessarily because of the uh, because of the adverse uh, event, but actually because of hypertension. You can have fever because of urinary infection, but this capacity to respond to individual issues will have to be taken and should be ready. So that's what we're trying to do as a private enterprise. So in, 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 in maybe just a closing, I like to really look at it as a targeted population, as a private sector, because the government has to create that... Uh, the backbone or a national framework. But we should be ready as a private enterprise to interoperate with this black backbone. Um, I hope that answered the thank question. Thank you, Paul.
Dr. Deliso, a rejoinder in uh, one of your responses po kanina or in your representation. Mm -hmm. You said po, galing po ito kay Sir Dan Pabellon, you said po, hindi pa nangyayari. Is it referring to the private companies providing 50% of their vaccine procurement to the national government? What is not happening? Trish, baka na disconnect si ano? Ay, okay. Uh, I think the question was, uh, yes, totoo po yan. Hindi po nangyayari yung private sector na nakakapag... Uh, nakakapag uh, Sorry po, uh, technical again. I, we really need to change the ISP. Um, Dr. Deliso, can you hear me po? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Yes I po. Think... Um, it was actually a rejoinder na yung pong question was uh, related dun po sa statement nyo kanina on the, um, let me just go over it again, from Sir Dan Pavilion. When you said po, hindi pa nangyayari, referring to the private companies providing 50% of their vaccine procurement to the national government, what is not happening po yung procurement ng private companies or yung sharing or giving the government 50% they agreed to provide? or both? Yung, yung nasa procurement pa lang po, mami, there was, I believe, there were already some payments, but there's not arrived. What has arrived are basically coming from the donation and the COVAX, meaning the the uh, the donated share uh, from the COVAX uh, global uh, assistance. No, so wala pa pong nangyayari na ang private sector ay may nareceive na po. At siyempre, hindi, wala pang nare-receive, wala pa rin na share sa government. So yun po ang, ang sitwasyon natin. However, the private private entities like, say, Clinica Manila is already receiving... Uh, vaccines as an LJU initiative because we are frontliners. Pero po yung mga private entities who really want to give their employees vaccination uh, at their cost, hindi pa po nangyayari po yun, uh, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Sir Dan. Okay po ba? So, so um, we have... In a way, run out of time na po, 12.32 na. So, um, thank you po to our dear panelists. Marami pong salamat for spending your time with us. Uh, from Mayor Joy and her staff again, Sir Bon, Engineer Yuli, uh, Dr. Deliso, and Engineer Kaloy. COVID has indeed accelerated the digital transformation practically all sectors of the society, whether businesses, academe, and government. Um, the rollout of the vaccine program, um, uh, while we see a lot of uh, initiatives, we also see a lot of areas for improvement. And it has been emphasized that we need to ensure that systems to support this vaccination program must not work in silos, but must be integrated. So very important for yung ICT and hopefully normalizing things during this pandemic. So thank you again to our speakers. I now turn over the floor to Director Trish. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Assistant Director Agnes, and what a wonderful panelist that you had there. Very esteemed uh, panelists uh, from the private sector and, of course, from our local government unit. My mayor, by the way, si, uh, A.D. Agnes, she's my mayor, si Mayor Bill Monti. So I'm very... Are you sure? Are yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it's good to know those things, you know, so yung ginagawa nila. So uh, I'm very glad that uh, she's, she's very responsive and, you know, she's very also IT savvy. Uh, so she's leading those efforts, no, um, and, and implementing uh, real game changers to uh, make uh, this vaccination program happen for Quezon City. But that reaches us to the end of the program this morning. It's already 12.30. Um, thank you for bearing with us. This is, has been uh, our first meeting for the quarter. But before we close, we should certainly cannot close this program uh, without some uh, closing remarks. So now let me invite him uh, to deliver his remarks for all of us, the CIO Forum Vice President and the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Management. Budget and Management, Sir Clarito D. L. Magsino. Asik Toto, 
please take right. note, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Trish. And good afternoon, everyone. First of all, on behalf of the CIO Forum, CIOF Foundation, and our partners and sponsors, I'd like to express our sincerest gratitude First, to Secretary Gregorio Anasan of the ICT for showing us a bright horizon and a viable way forward in building the infrastructure needed despite the difficult times we face at this moment. To Undersecretary Verhere, our very own Quezon City Mayora, Joy Belmonte, and Father Nick Ostriaco, Jr., for further enlightening us on the facts surrounding the present efforts of the government to protect our citizenry against this real threat to our lives and our people. And to our friends from the industry, Director Caloy Reyes, Mr. Bon Moya, Engineer Yuli Nagit, and Director and Dr. Grizo, for showing us that the same spirit of Bayanian that the country has displayed these past months can permeate the government's move to achieve one cohesive digital Philippines, starting with a policy framework in, in securing an inclusive and reliable connectivity in support of the urgent need to vaccinate the entire adult population of the country. My dad, who is now 98 years old, is a living testament that there is a future to any pandemic. In the late 40s, after the Second World War, work and studies took its toll on my dad. In his mid-20s, he got sick of pulmonary tuberculosis and had to stop studies and work. He had to rest. He was confined at the Kesson Institute for a few months. Well, for those who are not aware, Kesson Institute was a hospital for TB patients. It was not a school. With the grace of the Lord, at that time, streptomycin was already discovered. He had to be injected two vials of streptomycin twice a day for six months. His cousin, Pedro Sanchianco, who was at the time a medical student at UST, he was the one uh, giving him the inoculations. Thank God he was completely cured. Before streptomycin was discovered, those sick of pulmonary tuberculosis were doomed to die. For several months, he was also being monitored by another doctor who took his fluoroscopy at this clinic at Avenida Rizal well, for almost six months, every month. And mind you, TB is a highly contagious disease. The TB pandemic started in 1882 and was responsible for the death of one out of every seven individuals in the US and in Europe. What is being demanded of us right now is nothing compared to the fear of contracting tuberculosis then and the hassle and expense that got getting cured of the disease entails. Well, not so long ago, in our own lifetime, I had classmates and schoolmates in elementary and high school who had polio. For me, it was normal to see polio victims anywhere, in school, at church, in offices, and in factories. Now you hardly see them. And that is because of the ingrained and systematic practice of inoculating all children with a poly vaccine when they were still young. You ask a millennial nowadays if they know what polio is, they'll point you to the famous restaurant El Polio Loco at Mega Mall. You see, there is hope, there is a future, and we are here to make sure that we all get there to see that future soon. And we're all here to play a very important part in preparing for that future. We are practically at the crossroads, in the same crossroads, crossroads in history, when the horse-driven carriages were slowly being replaced by gasoline-fed engine-powered cars. Dirt roads and cobblestone roads, which are most comfortable for horses' hooves, were being replaced by paved roads meant for rubber tires. We too are now building the infrastructure and processes needed for a fully digital means of delivering public service to our entire citizenry. The digitiz digitalization effort is a whole society effort, and only the government can effectively orchestrate the coordination and provide the necessary supporting resources. Remember, our role as public servants is to serve the private sector who is tasked with creating wealth for the country. And we are here to help them push the economy up 
by allowing them to be productive despite the pandemic and for them to do their work safely and effectively, even if that means getting out of their way. Remember the Alip in Sangigilid? Our role as servants is to do and disappear, to be effective without fanfare, without being seen. We are all counting on you, our esteemed members of the CIO Forum, and our friends in the private sector, to make this digital transformation of government happen. Government offices will no longer be physical offices of brick and mortar, but wherever there's a laptop and an internet connection, that is where our government is. Maraming salamat pong muli at hanggang, hanggang sa muli nating pagkikita, mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much, Asek Toto Magsino. Oh. Noon, sir, thank you for those inspiring words. <laughs> okay, um, napagod ako doon. Kayo rin ata. No, there's been an information overload for our first general membership meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Um, before we go, I'd like to just, again, shout out to our sponsors. Uh, we'd like to thank the teams from Educate as our virtual event management system and conferencing platform of Intel, Solve, and Philippines, Inc. Uh, for providing this platform for us this morning. Thank you for them. Thank you to them and their team. Thank you, Microsoft Philippines and Converge ICT. Thank you also to our government partners, the ICT and DOH, our respectable speakers, no less than the DICT secretary and DOH on the secretary for Harry. And of course, we were very much pleased to have Reverend Father Ostiaco as our main speaker uh, this morning as well. So on, on that note, let us uh, just remind each other to remain vigilant in our own information drive, do our part in making it an inclusive hashtag ICT for vaccination program for all. This is Patricia Abel from the Department of Trade and Industry signing off and thanking our colleagues at the CIOF Forum um, and the CIOF Forum Foundation for this opportunity to serve as your MC this morning today. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and we will see you at the NICT Summit 2021. That's going to be, mark your calendars, June 24 to 25. See you then and stay safe and well everyone good afternoon to all of you bye bye